Shabbat Shalom. Do me a favor, like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and you know the drill. Uh, but also, leave a comment below. If you're listening to this on YouTube land, saying hi will suffice. Aloha from Argatha, or how about uh, Bonjour from Beaufort? Or Shalom, the Schumer family from Siberia. Who knows uh, who's listening? Just uh, drop me a quick line, say hello. That helps. Uh, less crickets in the comment um, section is always nice. Of course, not to overlook everyone from Tartaria because Tartarian lives matter. So if you're from there, be sure to say hello as well. I am definitely grateful for everyone here. So thank you for putting up with me uh, in this journey. And uh, some of you have been around for years. I was just talking to you guys about this before we got started. Some of the people here in this room tonight, uh, listening live, have been here for years. Others just for weeks and months. And I know you guys get tired of me and move on to other places. I, I get it. It, it. People kind of cycle in and out. Some people stay a long time. Some people cycle in and out. And sometimes your being here is, is just a season, and that's fine. Uh, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak into your lives anyways. Uh, my name is Noel Joshua Hadley, and y'all willing, I hope to be doing what I'm doing for another 20 or 30 years. Again, y'all willing. So for those of you who kind of grow tired and uh, I need somebody else and you kind of cycle in, just know that you can come back hopefully in the future and I'll have stacks of new information uh, for your consideration. Oh, and one more thing. I do appreciate the recent wave of positive encouragement that's been coming my way. It's the times when I'm ready to give up, I throw, throw in the towel, as you might say, and walk away, that y'all seems to speak through your voices to say uh, that I'm not alone in this. And I, I've had a lot of people sitting encouraging um, emails and other things, just saying how much uh, my research and my, my presentations have meant to them and their waking up process, but also their spiritual life. So I do appreciate that. All right. This tonight is... We will, we will be going through the Mandela effect, actually much more than that. And uh, before I get all uh, too sentimental here or chopping my words, let's just dive right into this. And I'll, I'll quickly explain before we do. Um, I, I don't say this because it gives me any kind of air of authority or anything like that. I'm just kind of laying it out as it was. Uh, I was all over the Mandela effect back in, back when it, it was the talk of the town, uh, especially 2016 seemed to be the big year. It started gaining uh, headway in like 2015. Uh, kind of, it, it seemed to parallel the flat earth. 2016 was a huge year. I, I remember being there, getting the news the morning, like the, the JFK, JFK's limousine went from four seaters to six seaters. I mean, I was just there in the middle of it, but it was also very volatile back then. And uh, the, the flat earth movement, a lot of people within that could, hated the Mandela effect. And uh, of course, a lot of people hated the Mandela effect. So I wasn't getting a lot of support um, for the Mandela effect from some of the people I needed the support from, from the flat earthers, because I was getting attacked on all sides. And eventually I kind of just dropped it. So it was about a year ago, last spring, when news hit again that CERN was going to fire up their engines, which they already have, is my understanding. Um, I was like, okay, I need to take out all my old notes. I wrote a lot on this back in the day and I, uh, scrubbed some of it, erased some of it out of frustration, uh, took it out of commission. I was able to dig through some of the old notes, pick up some stuff and pull it out and pull together this document. And as many of you guys know, who've been following along, I've been doing nothing but Mandela effect research over the last three weeks, especially just really digging into this. So I have a quick presentation tonight. Let's get right into it. The Mandela Effect. Uh, you see on page two, there are the contents on a lot of the stuff in there. Uh, the current up-to-date draft, starting on page five. The Mandela Psyop. The Mandela Effect is decades in the making and an obvious pet project of the Intel community. There it is. No surprise, even the media is pranking us. I figure pretty much everybody is in on it, but me and possibly you. Such conclusions might sound alarming at first, but eventually you settle into the groove. Was my second take better? I think it was. I'm not sure. The Mandela effect is intended to crawl up your skin to the point where you even, where even your shadow will itch, but you needn't let it. The Manson family was another obvious intel psyop, 
and in matters such as these, I'm reminded of it. When the family, the Manson family, said, let's go creepy crawling, they were referring to a game which involved sneaking the people's homes at night and rearranging their furniture while they slept. Sure, the Mansons reportedly committed the deed, but that's just Intel's way of telling us that spooks do it all the time. Today, they have the Intel net, but that's not to say they won't enter your home and reposition a book or two on the shelf. Flip a family photo, uh, photo around. Perhaps turn the thermostat. <laughs> the, I am stumbling with my words tonight. Perhaps turn the thermostat up a few notches. Let you sweat your nap nap time out. Your nappy nap time. If the boys down at Langley are feeling especially frisky, they'll swap out the family goldfish or hamster and then watch you deny it when your child claims otherwise. Why would they do something like that? The reason is obvious to screw with your head. But again, you needn't let them. It happened to me, you know. I'm keen to the behavior and have noticed a furniture piece or two rearranged in recent months. This even happened upon waking up in the morning, signifying that somebody had been standing within 10 feet of where I slept. Probably Kevin. That's what the, <laughs> that's what the Mandel effect is. The entire construct has become an obsessive game of creepy crawly. And you're the crazy one for noticing. FYI, Kevin is the name which I've given to the federal agent assigned to me. But let's not get sidetracked. Another term for what the Mansons were cooking in your kitchen has become a matter of therapy for abusive relationships, and that is gaslighting. The very phrase derives from the 1944 movie of the same name, Gaslight. Its plot centers on the Ingrid Bergman's uh, husband's attempt husband attempting to convince her that she's crazy so that he can lock her up in a mental institution, thereby robbing her of her house and her jewelry and the one thing that's most important to everyone, sanity. It sounds like the modern media. And then you see here a little uh, Wikipedia snippet from Gaslight. Gaslight is a 1944 American psychological thriller film directed by George Cooker, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. The Wikipedia explains it almost entirely as I did. They left out the part, however, where Ber uh, uh, Bergman's husband raises and dims the gas lights throughout her house and then convinces her that she is imagining the entire thing. Obviously, Hollywood is another wing of the Intel community, and Gaslight is one of those films in a long line of many where they confess to their crimes. The reason they keep doing it telling us to open our mouths and say ah while spoon-feeding us the magic choo-choo is because very few seem nor care to notice. Fun fact, the Wikipedia reminds us that Angela Lansbury made her film debut in Gaslight, which is no small coincidence since the Lansbury family also played a part in the Manson PSYOP. You see, we're already making connections. And I linked earlier to my Manson paper. You can read all about that which I've never given a presentation on. Maybe I will one of these weeks. Who knows? And then we come to it. George Orwell's 1984 novel. 1984 is no longer fiction, and you'd have to be living in a cave to be oblivious to that fact. Though now that I think about it, you're probably only living in a cave in this scenario because 1984 society offer, offered little other choice, and so not even that analogy is a good one. And seeing as how you're probably only reading this report on your off-grid compound, you already know the plot line. It's literally a playbook sitting on your shelf, which you refer to from time to time. I need to explain it again, that, but here it is. Anyways, Wikipedia tells us it is the Ministry of Truth's job to quote-unquote rectify historical records to accord with Big Brother's current pronouncements so that everything the party says appears to be true. Suddenly, I feel out of breath. You figure it wasn't easy for my favorite Intel publication to let that out. Uh, Wikipedia's uh, admission. Feels good, though, to speak the truth once in a while, don't it, Wiki? I mean, reading it felt uncomfortable. What they could have said in simpler terms is that the Intel community is actively rewriting history. One such method is the alteration of old films. Mind you, I'm not the one saying it. Orwell is. Incredible. Agent Orwell told us this would happen. The Mandela effect has been planned for decades, maybe even centuries. And in fact, it may have been going on for centuries already. 
Children, children's author Roald Dahl became the talk of the town in February of 2023, just one month ago, when it was reported, I throw you throw th three links your way here, here, and here, and in a thousand other newspapers, that several of his books were receiving the latest, greatest woke treatment due to some of his choice words being deemed too offensive. Mm -hmm. They're rewriting his books. For starters, the Oompa Loompas are now little people rather than little men, which sounds so stupid. If the differ differentiation somehow confuses you, it's probably because you're a straight, white, conservative male. Your very existence is probably offensive to the transgenders. But then the gluttonous chunker Augustus Gloop is enormous rather than fat. Seems to me that enormous is far more offensive than being a fatty, but why try to spoon feed sensitivity readers with a health, healthy dosage of logic? They're already victims of a hundred, if not thousands of Intel psyops and are showcasing the recognizable symptoms of Stockholm syndrome, like Patty Hearst, but on steroids. Of course, Patty Hearst was a hoax too. Precisely one week after the doll debacle, it was reported here and here, a couple links, that James Bond author Ian Fleming would be receiving his very own 1984 treatment. I will admit that one was a bit of a shocker but only because of the close proximity between announcements. The Ministry of Truth is either getting uh, lethargic and lazy or being a little too obvious uh, is in the points of their operation. They want us to see the pieces getting moved around on the board. Our emotional response is by design. Eventually, the moral outrage wears down into complacency due to some other controversy in the news, and the scriptwriters know it. I'm saying that's why they put them so closely together. They, they're, they're wearing you down. They want you to get shocked. And then the next time you're still shocked, but not as shocked. And then I think since I wrote this, now it's uh, L.L. Um, L. Stein of Goosebumps. Now, you know, he's, he's getting the 1984 treatment too. And they're just going to keep doing it until you're not shocked anymore. And you just cons uh, consent to it. As I was saying, eventually the moral outrage wears down into complacency due to some other controversy in the news and the script writers know it. The fanboys are in a hissy fit, but what they don't seem to understand is that 007 was always an Intel product. Can we expect outrage from the global public at discovering that inconvenient, that inconvenient truth? No, we cannot. And we see here uh, another little uh, snippet I cut out for you. Discovering the Dahl Fleming connection literally only took 30 seconds of my time. It was a hunch, and that is all. But look at what I dug up by punching both names into my search engine. Dahl and Fleming were M16 or MI6 buddies. Say it ain't so. How is it that nobody else on the internet is figuring that one out? It's so freaking obvious by now that the rewriting of their books is a media-backed psyop purposely staged re to resemble 1984. They do it all the time, but with intel creations like James Bond and Willy Wonka, they want you to know that it's being done. I already mentioned the moral outrage eventually leads to tolerance, and if there is any currency to the New World Order, compliance is it. But for all I know, the ghost of Dahl and Fleming whipped up their latest operation when they, uh, when they did to distract us from another operation altogether. And by the way, rectifying artwork is not illegal. Defacing art is. That's illegal. But changing it is not. Contrarily, the content creator is free to alter whatever he wants. George Lucas taught me that. George Lucas is free to have Hans shoot first and then change his mind 20 years later and have Greedo shoot first. Of course, now Disney owns it, so that now has changed a little bit. Now Disney can do whatever they want. It doesn't matter if fanboys notice the swap and get their pink knickers in a twist. Star Wars is his baby, and therefore defacing the galaxy or rewriting its history is not illegal, so long as he's the one doing it. Remind yourself again who runs Hollywood and the corporate United States. I would say Rome or the people sponsoring Zionism, but even they answer to someone, and that someone, top management, is who we know as Hasatan. Some people might argue with that, but let's just go with it for the moment. 
Don't you think his employees have a right to a boob job and a nip tuck now and then? Yes, they are lying to us, and yes, they will pay for it in the end, but there is a point to this exercise. If you're still upset because our controllers have swapped a product logo on their shelves via the Mandela effect, then I will kindly ask you to stop and check yourself before you wreck yourself. Stare into the mirror and ask the following questions. Are you a slave to corporate programming? And do you prefer it that way? Reality may be altered, but dependence upon the corporation is the reality for most. Nearly everybody wants a slice of the pie, but change or no change, it's all ending up in the same location anyways, and that is the lake of fire. Best to come to terms with that fact now. All right, that was my introduction. Let's get right into the next section. CERN's part in all of this. And of course, the context is still the Mandela effect. Hopefully everyone understood what I was getting at there. And, um, you know, the the content creators are have a right to change their own um, product. And um, I think that a lot of the, what I find, um, this won't win me brownie points in the community, but what I find is that a lot of the outrage with the Mandela effect, though it's very true and it's happening, it seems to be... I'll say idolatry. Like they, they, they're worshiping a product that this is what the idols do. They, they don't save you. They, they turn against you, you know, and, and people want something the way it was. And, um, you know, it, they're always going to betray you in the end. So certain part in all of this. Have you heard the news? The internet was created by this guy, y'all bet you didn't know that. I didn't either until the Mandela effect popped out from behind a conveniently hung drape, altering our reality, scaring everyone with the realization that the scarecrow was packing heat all along. His name is Timothy Berners-Lee, though his friends call him Tim Timble, I guess that is. Cute. Another fun fact is that he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II in 2004, making him a sir. Regarding his invention, we are given clues in the computer screen behind him. I see a CERN logo and a big, fat, juicy W. Don't, uh, don't quote me quite yet, but I'm thinking the W is for the World Wide Web. Yep, there it is. Found it. The same W that, found, that is found on the computer screen also happens to be the symbol for the World Wide Web. Complete with three W's and the tagline, let's share what we know. How adorable. You can thank me for my slew skills later. I feel like I'm like I'm uh, uh, I'm not speaking clearly tonight. Let me let me say that again. You can thank me for my sleuth skills later. The year was 1989 when all of this happened, and Sir Timble. I feel like I should come like Sir Sir Timble lot or something like that. Was working for everyone's favorite occult-based intergovernmental bond villain organization, CERN. I don't recall who actually invented the internet, but I get the feeling it wasn't him and that some other nerd was off from the time-space continuum. Remember the good old days when the internet was created by Al Gore? I know that's what a lot of us were probably thinking, but boy, were we wrong. It wasn't him. I thought it might be a good idea to involve documented evidence that Big Billy and Dr. Climate were having fun with computers in the 90s because you never really know. In an, alternative, in an alternate universe, this may be the very moment when the internet came to consciousness, and I'm keeping my options open. Why he's flashing the A-OK -okay is anybody's best guess. The second Easter egg on Sir Timble's computer screen is the CERN logo. The 666 is so obvious you'd have to be spiritually blind. You'd have to be spiritually blind not to see it. I'm also detecting two interlocking rings, both of which seem to say... Feeling cute might smash some protons and electrons together, blending portals into other realms, releasing evil entities from the abyss. That's what I get out of it, but I don't want to speak for everybody. What do you see? It's okay. We're being therapeutic here. Get it out. Don't hold it in. Regarding his employers, it's not like the Lord Shiva statue parked out front of their Geneva headquarters is calming everyone's suspicions. What is he doing exactly? 
He is dancing his way out of a Bollywood movie straight through an open portal and into our realm. Nothing to see here, I'm sure. I have never been to CERN, though I am told the plaque below him explains everything. But then seeing as how we're not at CERN and you are off in some other pocket of the world reading about it, I will have to do my very best to interpret what is transpiring. I looked this up. The dancing Shiva is known as the Nataraj and symbolizes Shakti, or the life force in the Hindu religion. Carl Sagan drew the metaphor between the divine dance of the Nataraj and the modern study of the cosmic dance of subatomic particles. It is through a well-choreographed dance and song number that he brought the universe into existence, uh, Shiva. Though let's not overlook another important character trait. Through the same method, he will become the destroyer of worlds. I'm not sure if that's the theme they're going with per se. I mean, destroying the world wouldn't look good on the resume. Using the powers of Shiva to cultivate and ultimately manipulate our realm, though, I'm sure that will turn out quite differently than the plot lines in nearly every movie we've seen on the subject. Carry on. Well, this took a, <laughs> well, this took a turn uh, towards the dark in a hurry. I am showing you a screenshot from the ritual video, which there's a link there, making the rounds. And I remember when this was, you know, the hot topic in 2016. Though a link has also been dropped. In the short span of two minutes, the person holding the camera manages to capture six hooded people surround a blonde haired woman. And then in the presence of their beloved Shiva statue, stick a knife into her. I've been to a few work parties in my day, but this one seems a little over the top. Obviously a hoax. Perhaps that's not what you were expecting, but hear me out on this one. The person holding the camera happens upon a scene before any key players enter the frame, and the woman isn't bound. She doesn't fight back. She doesn't even flinch. That's not a killing. It's nerds in white socks and sneakers who probably couldn't hold a conversation with a woman if they wanted to and clearly didn't know what to do with one now that they'd managed to seclude her from the herd. The only reason I'm hesitant to call it a fake is because Snopes says it was a prank, but also Wikipedia slopped together their own article claiming the same, and they call it the CERN ritual hoax. Having to agree with them for once is painful to a connect the dots specialist such as myself, but I think I'll manage in the end. Somebody from the PR department responded in saying that CERN, quote, doesn't tolerate this kind of spoof, unquote, because it gives rise to misunderstandings about the scientific nature of our work. But then we are never told of disciplinary action. How in the world did somebody not get fired for this one? Probably because it was an original CERN production. The video was released during the Mandela Effect tidal wave of 2016, and I believe they were intentionally trying to draw our attention through mockery. A joke is not always just a joke, you know. To say something like that is to completely misrepresent the very nature of a joke. Most of the time when a person cracks a joke, he or she is actually expressing their true feelings about the subject, even if it is uh, unintentional. Supposing CERN were to crack a joke about a coworker's driving skills, then somewhere in their heart they would actually feel that he or she had poor driving skills. The truth lies in the fact that it that it initially was a thought or an emotion in the person giving the delivery. Just as assuredly, a hoax is not always simply a hoax. There is magic to be found in the stage performance, even if it is passed off as humor. And as I've often stated, that is real magic. I'm thinking the CERN ritual video was released for the same reasons as to why the ritual horror genre was created in the first place, going all the way back at least to the 70s. Uh, no, there were horror films before that, you know, monster films, and the 60s started the whole zombie apocalypse thing. But, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, like, uh, the ritual horror movies that started coming out of Europe and other places uh, to mask and ultimately trivialize the reality behind satanic rituals in high places as well as the stuff films, let me say that again, the snuff films being passed around by the elite. 
The recording may have been intended as mockery aimed at the suspicions of the conspiracy theorist, when in fact it was projecting what they were truly about. Stop trolling us, CERN. But getting back to this guy and the invention of the internet, a different pose and office, same shirt and computer screen. According to official history, CERN is the creator of the World Wide, Wide Web now, WWW. Debate it all you want, but unless you've got a time machine parked out back, it is what it is. We were told from the beginning that it was a free gift for humanity when in fact its purpose could be found in the logo. Let's share what we know. Read between the lines. The internet creators wanted to gather as much data as is possible. What they needed from us is volunteers. And we took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. It is, after all, a web, a web of deception. The reality is that people with the uh, combina uh, combination to the black box, let me say that again. The reality is, is that people with the combination to the, back, uh, uh, the black box know more about us than we do about ourselves. And that's a whole other uh, discussion right there. Once compiled, the data would have been used to create si uh, simulations of the future. Stop trying to argue. We know Robert McNamara, uh, McNamara and the Pentagon was already creating these programs during the Vietnam era. I should have said were there if you're a, 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 a grammar Nazi. They were already creating these programs. I seem to recall that ticker tape computer that predicted in 1967 how the U.S. had already won the war in Vietnam two years earlier in 1965. Sounds like a broken bot if you ask me. That was nearly 60 years ago, though. You figure they, uh, the crystal balls they've been hiding are improved upon since then. And so think back upon your life at something you regret. An indiscreet moment, a gross oversight, a tragic mistake or a failure to act which changed the course of your life. What if you could go back and correct it? That is what advanced simulations can do. With enough information, they can chart a path which might connect the little changes in history with the drastic changes in the present, at least the ones that bring the best outcome. Suppose for the moment that CERN really is capable of time travel. I'm not necessarily invoking human time travel, like Marty McFly nor am I canceling out the possibility. Presently, I'm talking about the ability for our present controllers to send information to our past controllers so as to inform them on how to better control the subjects of our realm, even if it means dimming the gaslight. They would need computers to do that. Most likely, they could only go back as so far as the information highway allows for when computers were capable. I'm thinking the 70s, but perhaps even to McNamara's ticker tape fortune teller, though really probably maybe even the 1800s. I mean, we don't really know how far back these computers go. They, they may have had them that far back. That would explain why we are only noticing subtle differences. The idea is that Stern is using the future, or rather our present, to improve its technology in the past, to help speed things along, you know. They may even uh, be a. T they may even been. There's a little a lot of uh, Rif uh, Rifka effects this week, which is appropriate. They may even be attempting to manipulate the very fabric of time, throw us into some sort of loop, and which I might discuss at a later hour. I won't be talking about that tonight, but I think it's an interesting thought. And uh, the, the movies like The Matrix Three talks about that. Really, there are numerous possibilities, though in this scenario, you may have noticed that it is the complete reversal of cause and effect. There is a name for that, and it is retro causality. Backwards causation is a concept of cause and effect supported by quantum theory in which an effect precedes its cause in time, and so a later event affects an earlier one. You should be happy to know that there are people sitting around in their mom's basement, always on the lookout for the new crops which might spring up as a result of time travel. They are heroes of our realm, and I think they may be onto something. According to CERN's own website, the first proton-proton collision happened at CERN in 1971. But wait, 
I am of the generation which distinctly remembers their first proton-proton collision in 2010. It made news because we were on the cusp of the, the Mayan year of 2012, and it was the god particle they were after. Have they been successful in sending data back to scientists in the 70s? Because the 1971 collision is becoming fairly common knowledge now, though it certainly wasn't in 2010, even though it is now shown to have been reported upon in their newsletters. Another oddity claimed as a matter of fact among the CERN historians is a machine called the LEP, which supposedly existed many years before the, the modern one, the LHC, which that's an acronym for Large Electron uh, Positron Collider, the LEP. I am showing you a picture of the present LHC, which wasn't operational until 2008. Do an online search for the LEP, though, and tell me what you see. All I'm getting is pictures of the LHC spit right back at me. Wikipedia isn't helping either. Is CERN pranking us with a false history via construction photos of the LHC passed off as the LEP, or were they successful in the space-time continuum game of phone tag? I'm not the only one saying this. Nope, not making it up. On the flip, people will accuse me of plagiarizing if I don't link you to my source material. And so I suggest you read it for yourself straight from the horse's mouth. There's the link right there. And I'll describe what, I'm, what the article says. CERN's physicists Thomas Wheeler and uh, Chewy, uh, Chu Man Ho are straight up putting it out there that the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, is theoretically a time machine capable of causing matter to travel backwards in time. And what do they mean theoretically? Like, how do you accidentally, theoretically build a time machine? That doesn't just happen. You don't just, like, go into the janitor closet and rearrange things. Oops, I created a time machine. Did you follow the link? Then you will know that I'm not attempting to impress you by starting a fire while tooting flatulence out of my crack. They typically only put these little details out there when they've already committed the deed. They don't begin talking about it as a possibility until they've done it. And so look at, look at what else the boys down at CERN are telling us. One of the major goals of the Collider was to find the elusive Higgs boson, or boson, also known as the God Particle. The Higgs boson is claimed to be the particle that gives mass to matter and what is known to be the cause of the Big Bang. I know. Well, that goal has already passed. They're looking to check off other boxes now, one of which includes creating a second particle, what they have dubbed to be the Higgs singlet, single, singlet. And here is where the time travel comes into it. According to M theory, or the so-called theory of everything, there are as many as 11 dimensions, of which the universe uses only four. It's, it's almost kind of similar, I think, in... And how, you know, we use so little of our brains. But there's much more to it. We inhabit three of them, though the fourth belongs to time. With all that atom smashing, the Higgs singlet is theoretically expected to jump into the fifth dimension, thereby overriding the laws of physics which govern our universe. Once making that leap, the Higgs singlet could travel through the hidden dimensions and then re-enter our own reality at a point forward or backward in time. And then look at what Wheeler's conclusions, uh, and then look at Wheeler's conclusions, why don't you? Let's see if I can read this. One of the attractive things about this approach to time travel is that it avoids all the big paradoxes. Because time travel is limited to these special particles, it is not possible for a man to travel back in time and murder one of his parents before he himself is born. For example, however, if scientists could control the production of Higgs singlets, they might be able to send messages to the past or the future, according to Professor Thomas Wheeler in the article. Did you catch all of that? Perhaps not. Here, I'll write it out for you on the basis that you might otherwise need a magnifying glass. <laughs> I forgot that I put that in there because I would have read what I uh, wrote because it was hard for me to read that. Anyways, you see it right there. Why are they telling us this information if it is not even remotely possible? 
Somebody out there is rolling their eyes and sighing so heavily that I can smell their breath this very moment. And a day or so ago, the screen on my computer cracked. The cause is still a mystery. Though I am thinking it is from the pendulum swing of a scorned reader's eyeball. Who do you suppose is writing the checks for all of those experiments? CERN is being financially sponsored by Germany, the UK, Italy, France, Spain, the United States, India, and Russia. There's a reason why CERN is being compared with the modern Tower of Babel, because there is no other comparison. It's not like the secretary stumbled upon the Shiva statue at a swap meet and thought placing it near the entrance would help cozy up the place. Speaking of the woman's touch, we now come to learn that the first ever photograph uploaded to the World Wide Web was an all-female doo-wop pop group called Les Horribles Cernites. Ever hear of them? Nope, me neither. It's French for the Horrible Cern Girls. Lovely title, by the way. Simply adorable. The quartet also happens to be founded by employees at Cern. But then look at their initials. LHC lines up with Large Hadron Collider. They apparently even cut an album. And have you read the song titles? Try not to, uh, well, <laughs> I guess roll your eyes. They might get stuck like that. Nearly every single one of them is intended mockery as only the architects and programmers at CERN know how. Where they really screwed up is... Uh, where they really screwed up is... or I'm sorry. Where they... Uh, I'm really stumbling tonight, guys. Where they really screwed up is with their single, Surfing the Web. It was released as a single in 1996, but it was recorded years earlier in 1992. And, and who even spoke like that then? Surfing the web. Are you telling me that CERN invented the phrase? Surfing the web? Unbelievable. The last track on their album is called Anti-World. I bet that one's epic. The only downer in all of this is that they didn't cut a track to the, to the tune of My Boyfriend's Back and have it be about Nelson Mandela. That being said, I also, uh, I also don't LHS. I don't recall any of it. <laughs> Man, there's. I'm sorry, guys. There's so many typos tonight. I don't recall any of it, and I've never spoken with anyone who does uh, reg re uh, regarding this group. Looks like we're all falling behind in history class faster than they can write it, which has me thinking this may be a time travel movie we're inhabiting, but it's also starting to become a cringeworthy one. I kind of want out of it. Sir knows Syop like the son of Nimrod knows his mother, and they just love slapping us repeatedly with those tea bags they're brewing in the back room. That couldn't be any more evident than their happy music video. The one where they're dancing around like the trauma room nurses during the height of the COVID psychodramatic episode, telling us they were years ahead in the game. I am linking it here, the, the happy video, and suggest you watch it. The video is soggy, wet with innuendos. I'm seeing women down in the boiler room invoking the many arms of the Dark Lord Vishnu, probably to compliment their Shiva statue. And then there's a dude taking a ride through the LHC as though this were the defunct Disneyland attraction Adventures Through Inner Space. Not sure what to make of that one. Either he's spiced up his spaghetti with Auntie Alice's shrooms, or they are telling us they were successful in sending their first message, maybe even a physical courier, on a trip into the Twilight Zone. Is that why they're happy? Look at when the video was dated, November 3rd, 2014. It was released just a few months before the Mandela Effect began drawing worldwide attention. If you've ever wondered why CERN and the ME are connected, then look no further than their happy video. They've already drawn the constellation in the sky for us. The moment arrives when the old man sits in his office among mountains of paperwork, giving us the thumbs up. He's holding up a sign which states, we are happy at CERN. But then there are the two signs hung from his neck. The first reads Bond number one, whereas the second is Mandela. Bond is in James Bond? Well, then trivia question. Who played the first James Bond? If your answer is Sean Connery, then in the game of hot and cold, you are shivering. You might as well be so far south as to have your tongue stuck to the firmament. No, the very first James Bond was somebody named Barry Nelson. He played him in the original 1954 Casino Royale movie. 
yeah, I was as surprised as you about that one. As a lifelong fan of the Bond movies, I, I was back in the day, I knew of Connery as well as Lazenby, Moore, Dalton, and Brosnan. I also knew of the Woody Allen Casino Royale movie in 1967. But why is it that nobody has thought to mention the apparent fact that Sean Connery was ever only falsely attributed to the first James Bond until now? This whole thing is smelling about as fishy as a seafood market. But at any rate, put the two last names together and what do we come up with? Connery Mandela? No, wrong reality. It is Nelson Mandela now. There is your other reason as to why they're happy in Switzerland. Supposing CERN attended the ball and the large Hadron Collider were the pumpkin created by their fairy godmother, then it should not surprise anyone at the sheer number of new animals being discovered over the last decade. They fit snug into the slipper. Have you seen these creatures? Nobody's batting an eye at them, but maybe they should. We are given names like sea pig and scale worm, and that little pink squishy thing is an adorabilis, because it's so adorable, you see. No, I'm not joking. Just say aw and be done with it. What the hell is a Japanese space slug? It was discovered in a parking lot. Somebody seriously needs to have the people in that condominium complex checked out. Let's be honest, most of them look like they've arrived from another dimension. They look Lovecraftian. They weren't kidding when they made all those B-movies in the 1950s science fiction era. And then there is that insanely cuttable, bunny-eared, dog-faced creature right there. It's called a pika. They are exclusive to China because, quite frankly, the panda wasn't enough on the cute factor. Don't let the fluff and the button nose fool you, though. It would probably bite your head clean off, given the opportunity. How in the world did an actual living teddy bear go unnoticed all these years? Oh, and in other news, Australia has a humpback dolphin now. As Joe Biden would say, come on, man. And lest I forget, we have unicorn whales now. They are technically called narwhals. The snooty upper-class fanatics spill it out as narwhal, or narwhal. But you and I know what we're really looking at. Has anybody let SeaWorld know about them? If unicorns of the sea don't sell plush toys, then I don't know what will. What are they doing? Sword fighting, obviously, duh. It's the 21st century. Get with the fifth dimension. The gorillas don't beat their chest with their fists anymore, y'all. They slap them. The official answer by the Jane Goodall people is that they cut their hands in rapid succession. Knuckles side up, never down. What in the world is all I have to say about that? I have been to the zoo. I have personally observed monkeys fling poo, which is another observation entirely, because the apes uh, have beaten their chest as well. If apes had been cupping their hands and slapping themselves all this time, then we would have known. Just go ahead and type Gorilla Beat Chest into the Google search engine and then tell me what you see. Here, I'll show you what I saw. Illustration after illustration of apes beating their chest, knuckles down, parked right alongside actual photographs of gorillas slapping themselves. Ridiculous. Do I even need to go through all the pop culture references on this one? Spare me. King Kong beat his chest in 1933, interesting number, and he's still up to no good in the latest movies. Even the toy companies, paying very careful attention to detail, reproduce his bad behavior. I threw in the 1981 Donkey Kong arcade just to be certain. Yep, beating his chest like a naughty monkey. Still committing the deed in the latest installments as well. Artists visit zoos, you know. It's how they learn to mimic the animal's behavior on the page, or in the video game, or in the movies. I've barely even dug into the Mandela Effect yet, and already the normies are running out of excuses. Every person and artist is the victim of a false memory, apparently. Even those who are making the false memory claim remember it differently. I would say there aren't enough blue pills to go around, but then I'd be underestimating the aims are for controllers and their pharmaceutical companies. I need to pause for a drink of coffee. If you need caught up, we're on page 27. I'm particularly excited about this part right here. The Back to the Future movies, 9-11 and Donald Trump. 
we inhabit a reality in which Biff Tannen not only ran for the presidency, but he also successfully planted his bum for a four-year stint in the Oval Office. You know it, and I know it. Everybody knows it. Oh, please, don't even pretend like you haven't thought about that one already. For that lone person in the room who hasn't the faintest clue what I'm talking about, Biff Tannen is the guy going around calling everyone a butthead in the Back to the Future trilogy, but then ends up eating manure cyclically. He's also the guy who says like puns wrong, like make like a tree and get out of here instead of leave. It was in the second movie that Doc Brown and Marty McFly returned to 1985 after a short stint in 2015, only to learn that a middle-aged Tannen rules Hill Valley from his casino penthouse. The reason this happened is because Marty wrestled with the temptation, albeit a brief one, to use Doc's time golem for monetary gain. So technically, the, the plot line of the whole first movie is he uses it for his own gain. I checked. Donald Trump announced he was in the running on June 16th, 2015. That is the very year in which Old Biff retrieved the sports almanac and then stole the DeLorean, thereby altering the natural course of things into a skewed dystopian timeline, ruining everything. Supposing the occasion should arise that I'm the first to discover anything, then I will be sure to let you know about it. This simply isn't one of them. Many others have made the Tan and Trump connection long before me, going all the way back to 2015. It's so obvious as to be borderline unoriginal by this point. Back to the Future Part 2 was released in 1989, some 26 years before Trump made his announcement. So what are we dealing with then? Predictive programming? That's what I used to think. Not so long ago, I would have sat here and told you that Trump had already been selected for the part in 1985. Have you seen the episode of Oprah where the Don teases his impending presidency? I'll link it right here. It aired in 1988, though it's not the only one. There are others. Uh, some earlier footage as well. It seems as though interviewers were often bringing up the president question. And why? But then supposing Trump was selected so early in the game, he would have to wait around another 30 years to live the dream. By the by, that's precisely what Doc Brown told Marty on the night of the Hill Valley lightning storm. He said he'd have to wait around another 30 years to befriend him again. How could the elite possibly promise anything so grand and so far into the future? There was no possible way of knowing how long he'd have to live. He could have walked out onto Fifth Avenue and been run over by a cab on the following morning. Unless they already knew all possible outcomes, that is. Doc Brown was somewhat confident that he'd meet Marty again because Marty had arrived from the future, which ensured that outcome. Which is why I'm suggesting that Back to the Future isn't simply a movie about time travel. No, it is a movie which is only made possible because of time travel. Much has been made of the predictive programming as even 9-11 comes into it, and I'll cover some of that. But there is something else going on, which very few seem to notice or appreciate. Yes, the flux capacitor makes time travel possible, but even that scientific miracle could not happen without firsthand knowledge of the esoteric, or you could say the occult. Consider the scene when Marty's kiss with Jennifer is interrupted by the save the clock tower lady. Lightning struck the clock 30 years ago, you know, and it hasn't worked since. Look behind her and tell me what you see. There is a business called the third eye a reference to the pineal gland. But then the eye can be seen within a pyramid telling us that Horus is the one being beckoned. In Back to the Future Part 2, or BTTF Part 2, Marty is approached by a man named Terry. And though the year is 2015, the clock tower still isn't working. The next time you watch that particular scene, pay careful attention to the Harry Krishna people in the background. I was actually trying to look for a screenshot of it uh, on the internet, I wasn't able to. And I didn't feel like rinsing the movie for you guys just to get a screenshot. They are dancing precisely in the whereabouts of the former Third Eye building. Not a coincidence. The Back to the Future movies are a retelling of the mysteries of Isis. From here on out, spotting the osiris isis Horus relationship manifested in George McFly, Lorraine Baines, and their son Marty is the easy part supposing you know a thing or two regarding the mystery religions. And for once, the incestual kiss in the, uh, did I say ancestral? 
I guess it was ancestral, but the incestual kiss in the car should finally make sense. The mommy backseat routine was started long ago between Semiramis and the son of Nimrod. It's an obelisk thing. I'm actually surprised at how long it's gone, gone unnoticed. Uh, I, I've never seen anybody else comment on the fact that the Back to the Future movies are clearly a retelling of the Mysteries of Isis. Marty became an avatar of his father so that his father might ultimately be molded into his image or the image of his son, thereby creating a future which could better benefit all three of them. You'd think George decking Biff in the school parking lot would complete Marty's mission. But then what happens moments afterwards? Some jerkwad cuts in on George and Lorraine's dance, momentarily prompting George to give up on their Trinitarian arrangement. Marty immediately begins to vanish, beginning with his hand. And now for some trivia. What god could be seen in the corner overseeing the festivities? Think back. He can clearly be seen when George looks at his watch and realizes he's late in apprehending the stage performance, the ritual sex magic, whereas his son is expectedly, ma expectedly making out with his mother. Neptune. The answer you were looking for is Neptune, Elohim of the Ocean. The enchantment under the sea dance plays out precisely as the title implies. It is a ritual by which Marty finds himself entering the abyss. It's none other than his death scene. It's like I can't see that. Like it, I, it finally occurred to me, like, oh my goodness, that's the death scene. But it is also his resurrection. If Marty was an initiate up until this point, then he is about to become an ascended master. I'll get to that in a moment. And I've, I've pointed this out many times in the past, uh, if you've been with me for a while, that uh, I expect that uh, these death and resurrection ceremonies that go on within the mystery religions and the deep occult uh, go beyond symbol. There's, there's something more going on, as uh, told in movies like this one. And I think I covered that a little bit on the... Um, the presentation I gave a couple months back on all of Ham's children, the mystery children. The Isis narrative takes on further meaning through the constant meddling of Biff Tannen, a.k.a. Donald Trump. In all three movies, he threatens disorder, though his role as set couldn't be made any more apparent than the turn of events in the second movie. Marty discovers that the middle-aged Biff from the alternate timeline has murdered his father. Why is all of this so familiar? Well, Set murdered Osiris for starters, leaving Isis to raise their miracle child, Horus. When Osiris George commanded Isis Lorraine, he materialized what was known to the Egyptians as the rule of Matt. And again, I talked about this in that recent presentation on Ham's children. Matt perso uh, personified the ideal natural order, truth, balance, harmony, law, morality, and justice. Once Set slash Biff usurped the throne of Osiris George and took Isis Lorraine as his wife, Matt was replaced by disorder, balanced by, balanced by imbalance. The Egyptians referred to Matt's replacement as Isfit, a world in which injustice, chaos, violence, and evil manifest into the material world and reign supreme. It would take Horus slash Marty, miraculously conceived a child of Osiris through Isis, have you forgotten about the car scene? To usurp the usurper and restore Matt to the natural order of things. As I mentioned earlier, the miracle of science in the BTTF movies is the flux capacitor. In its simplest terms, a capacitor stores electricity in an electrical field. And so if it can be stated that matter is always in a state of flux moving from point A to B and so on, then a flux capacitor is the method by which the power of the fifth element might be ultimately harnessed. To be more specific, time travel is an aim by which our, materi our material reality can only be twisted and contorted, ultimately bending to the will of the one who is capable of circumnavigating the natural laws by which we are all expect expected to oblige or, you could say, be governed by. 
When Doc's plans go awry at the hands of the Libyan terrorists and Marty finds himself stuck 30 years in the past without any plutonium, it will take the literal act of Prometheus stealing fire from the gods in the form of lightning striking the clock tower so as to prove why McFly has secured his role as an ascended master. He is none other than the trickster of mythology, Mercury incarnate. In a single perfectly timed instance, he has confronted nature at its crossroads while simultaneously bending it to his will, thereby expanding the boundaries of all that are deemed possible. It is immediately after Marty apprehends Zeus's bolt while accelerating at 88 miles per hour they were, that we are given our most important 9-11 reference. And boy, has this not been discussed by the connected dot specialists already. You'd have to be asleep behind the wheel not to see it by this point. I spy a nine on the left of the screen, which complements the fiery tire tracks making up the number 11. There is your 911. The time machine, of course, drives directly into the town cinema. A mirror image will reveal NWO, an acronym for New World Order. What are they trying to tell us? The post on the right of the screen forms a one, giving us even more clarity. 91101 is a precise and otherwise unfathomable prediction, assuming the future was not already known. The Rapture crowd certainly never had it this good. The irony here is that the 911 reference only comes about because Marty was successful in his mission. The 1985 that he is returning to is by no means the same one that he left behind. It is an alternate one. He has alchemically transformed history for his own personal benefit. There's a 4x4 awaiting him in the garage, and a subdued Biff is waxing it, so as to make his weekend at the lake with Jennifer extra nice if you get my drift. The time travel component is what appears to be missing in all of these 9-11 discussions, which is slightly odd considering the source material. What I'm saying is it doesn't seem like I'm seeing anyone... Uh, make the observation that the 9-11 predictive programming only happens because of time travel. I, I think the first reference is uh, in the movie is when, uh, is it the dog's name is Einstein, right? And it goes back in time in the parking lot of the Twin, Pine Mall, at the Twin Pines Mall and the stopwatch says 9-11. Again, that, it happens because of time travel. So what are they trying to tell us? The Mandela effect meets 9-11 and time travel at the beginning and the end of uh, of the first movie. Let me say that again. The Mandela effect meets 9-11 and time travel at the beginning and the end of the first movie. In a little while, I will be sure to cover two separate MEs that transpire in the same scene. One thing at a time, though. First with 9-11. Marty's adventure begins and ends in the parking lot of the Twin Pines Mall. The sorcerer explains to his apprentice that the mall had been developed over a farm owned by somebody named Peabody, who had the strange idea of breeding pine trees. Within a few short minutes, Marty unintentionally takes the DeLorean on a trip through time, crashing, crashing through one of Farmer Peabody's twin pines in 1955. So upon returning to the same location in 1985, albeit an alternate one, which benefits him, at 1.33 a.m., wink, wink, the name has changed to Lone Pine Mall. I had earlier mentioned that Marty was resurrected in the abyss of his school's auditorium. Well, it turns out Doc Brown undergoes his own ceremony. He dies on the asphalt of the Twin Pine Malls, the Twin Pines Mall, after being pumped full of lead by the angry Libyans, only to be raised from the dead at the Lone Pine Mall. There is your transition between the Twin Towers and the One World Trade Center building. Also, we are reminded of Nelson Mandela's miraculous resurrection from prison, despite the collective memory of many, all of whom remember a totally different outcome. It just goes to show that Back to the Future is an obvious Intel movie. The swap from twin to loan may not be an actual Mandela effect, but it seems quite apparent that they were showing us how it's done. In the very least, they had already done the deed or that they one day intended to. The only person who had intimate knowledge of the name change was Marty. You have to wonder, though, how many of the normies inhabiting the so-called new and improved 1985 of the town cinema spilled backwards, the NWO, 
would be plagued with a false memory. I mean, how many people would rem remember it as the Twin Pines Mall, even though it says Lone Pine? Adding further fuel to the obvious, the Twin Towers in New York are outright shown to us in Back to the Future Part 2. It happens when Grandma Lorraine criticizes how worn out Marty's television screen is. Blink and you'll miss it. Two pine trees can be seen morphing into the Twin Towers. Apparently, Robert Zemeckis, Bob Gale, Steven Spielberg and company were rather concerned that the twin Lone Pine Mall analogy would be lost to the viewer on the last go around. Way to make it obvious, guys. The scene even includes Grandpa George hanging by his feet upside down. You've got to be kidding me. How the hell did they know the Hangman tarot card would be de demonstrated for us in shock and awe theatrics only moments before the North Tower fell? Also, why would Intel go out of their way to secure the Hangman imagery simply to secure the accuracy of an 80s movie? The Hangman, in case you are unaware, is the card that suggests ultimate surrender, sacrifice, or being suspended in time, but also intuition, divination, and prophecy. And then you got a couple pages here of the 9-11 uh, predictive, predictive programming that we've all seen. And this is just a, a drop in the bucket, really. How much there is out there. It's overwhelming. Of course, the 9-11 predictive programming goes way beyond Back to the Future. I'm only showing you a handful of them, though the list goes on and on and on and on. Examples can be found across the full spectrum of pop culture and throughout the decades as well, going as far back as the 70s. Maybe earlier, but the 70s seems to be where it really picks up, which is a, kind of an interesting theme in all this. Furthermore, ranging from comic books to album covers and movies. You've likely seen the Simpsons reference and the mirrored image of Super Tramp's Breakfast in America album. The Illuminati card is an obvious choice, though Neo's passport, which expires on 9-11-2001 in The Matrix, is probably a favorite reference for many of us. Cookie Monster eating the Twin Towers in 1976, only a few years after the towers were built, is a bit much if I do say so myself, seeing as how Sesame Street is marketed to preschoolers. And then there is the 1994 Iron Man cartoon, which shows the Twin Towers getting hit, but also a missile hitting the Pentagon. Again, this is but a small selection. The entire spectrum is indeed dizzying. The 70s, as you will recall, may prove to be the decade when the future contacted the past. I, if, I, if I had to guess, I mean, again, someone's going to tell me it happened in the 1800s or earlier, fine. Though obviously there's no way of my possibly knowing that. The tech may very well have been available decades, if not centuries before that. Therefore, I'm going to go out on a limb here and reiterate my earlier claim. We're inhabiting a time travel movie. The Twin Towers and NYC may have very well fallen before we were smothered with the predictive programming as a chain of events go. Light that pipe and smoke it, why don't you? BTTF gives us even further clues as to how it's done. Marty is played off like an angelic or alien visitor on several occasions. The audience knows he is human, but that doesn't necessarily mean those whom he interacts with believe him to be one. When Marty breaks into George's bedroom dressed up as in the atomic suit, also known as like Atomic Boy, threatening to melt his brain if he doesn't ask Lorraine out to the dance, Spielberg and company may be spilling the beans as to what is truly going on. The extraterrestrial phenomena isn't what it's made out to be. It is artificially inseminated into our consciousness through human agency. What effect resulted from Marty's interaction? Many. For one, Marty benefited in parents resembling better pedigree. But then the chain of events was substantial enough as to include George's first science fiction novel 30 years later, a publication which we, the audience, knows was based upon his real-life experiences in high school. The Alien Encounter episode, as it relates to Intel, may not be directly referencing time travel and is certainly not exclusive to it, but Marty's entire E.T. story arch is, obviously. That couldn't be any more evident than with his initial exit from the world stage. After his parents kissed during the Starlighter's rendition of Earth Angel, which is another purposeful E.T. reference, Earth Angel, Marty helps to kickstart the rock and roll revolution with his wild rendition of Johnny Be Good. It is played off like a joke, 
especially since Marvin Berry calls his cousin Chuck Berry up. You guys all know the scene, met performance so that he can listen in over the phone line and glean inspiration from it. Steal it, if we're being technical, every chord and lyric, and then claim it as his own. What are they telling us about the creation of rock and roll? More like rock music as a whole. Well, I have already shown you in other papers that it was an intel operation from the very beginning. Again, not proof of time travel by any means, though as I have explained already, the idea is that CERN has already intervened and meddled with past events, first and foremost to improve their own technology, but ultimately to perfect our controller's rule over us. If this is true, then even the fourth dimension has become a psyop. If you still require evidence as to how BTTF is an Intel movie, then look no further than Marty's daughter, Marlene. She's played by Michael J. Fox, who happens to be her father, and she's a dude. I will remind you that the year is 2015. Perfect precision. We are told that Marty and Jennifer had a son and a daughter, when in reality, two sons came out of the womb. When people talk about what the filmmakers got right and wrong, they always seem to leave out the part about the tranny. A point I'll be trying to make moving forward uh, through the rest of this paper, I won't cover it all tonight, obviously, is that the Mandela effect was getting noticed before Fiona Broom or anyone else got around to naming it the Mandela effect. Therefore, you cannot tell me it is simply the power of suggestion. That is what many of our controllers are pushing out in their psychology research. And there's whole colleges doing, you know, research uh, studies on this now about the, the, the false memory that all of us have and the power of suggestion and all that. It's all part of the gaslighting process, but it's simply not true. Those of us who notice these irregularities before this entire discussion was fermented didn't have a context for what was happening at the time. Well, I'll speak for myself. I began noticing some of the changes which I hoped to discuss, and in every instance they gave me a dark and uncomfortable feeling. A common way to deal with the emotion is to tuck it away on a shelf in the furthest corner of the mind, and then go about one's business like a good boy swallowing a steady diet of blue pills. That, that approach is simply not for me, though, at least not anymore. It is appropriate that Back to the Future is being discussed because the Libyan terrorist fan was one of the first changes that came to my attention, and long before the whole Mandela effect. I was watching Back to the Future one day when the Libyans suddenly pulled up in a blue VW bus to off Doc Brown. A chase unfolded between the Libyans and the VW bus and the driver and the DeLorean. And all the while, I'm sitting there squinting my eyes at the television screen thinking, what the hell? There was something very wrong with the entire experience. How ironic is it that a movie based upon time travel would become the mugging victim of an alternate reality or paradox prank? Am I right? Or as Doc Brown might put it, you know, erase erased from existence. And this right here is the terrorist van that I remember. Take a good look at it. It took me a while to track it down, but here it is. I actually wrote an article about this, at least back in 2017, uh, tracking down this photo and showing it on the website. A 1984 Toyota van. It's the model that I recall seeing upon its release at the drive-in, and then years thereafter on VHS as well as cable television. And so, as I was saying, observing these changes with no context brought about a dark and unsettling feeling. My only option, as I understood it then, was to chuck the movie and never watch it again. It took discovering the Mandela effect to gain a clearer picture of what was happening. To, to reiterate that, when I noticed the difference, uh, it bothered me so much. Uh, I, was, I was like, is this like a digital alteration? What's going on? I, I couldn't watch the movie again for years until I figured uh, it might have been two, three years. I don't know how long it was. Uh, until I discovered the Mandela effect in 2016. The second Mandela effect that I had earlier mentioned in passing is the J.C. Penny, clearly visible from the parking lot of the Twin Pines Mall. That too has been altered. J.C. Penny used to be spelled without the E between the N and the Y, making it J.C. Penny no E. That's how I remembered in the 80s and even afterwards in the 90s. How do you remember its spelling? Furthermore, Marty videotaped Doc Brown at the very moment when the Libyans pulled up in 1985. J.C. Penny could be seen in the background. And so even after the Mandela effect changed its spelling to J.C. Penny with an E, and this one I, of course, ping pong back and forth, footage from the camcorder when played on Doc Brown's television in 1955 still showed the proper spelling. 
which is to say J.C. Penny, without the E. You will have to take my word for it, though. I was working my way through the movie the other day and could no longer find evidence of this stated paradox. Then again, J.C. Penny, with the E and without, has been the ongoing victim of a ping pong swapping back and forth between spellings, confusing everybody, precisely as these time travel movies are intended. Quick coffee break. You guys are all following along tonight. The Wizard of Trump, or the Time Traveling Trumps, as I originally called this. And so, with time travel potentially already being a thing of the past, it really shouldn't surprise anyone to find traces of residue, more like sudden emergences in the pages of history. Like Marty McFly's tampering with George McFly, the science fiction novelist in his teenage bedroom, we too may discover the creepy crawling of time bandits, by which I give you Ingersoll Lockwood's book series. Ever heard of him? Yeah, me neither. Nobody had, by the way, until 2017, by the sounds of it. And uh, there's even a wiki article discussing the strange emergence after a century and some change of total obscurity from the limelight. What they don't tell you is that the conspiracy theorists were on it first before the media ever picked up the story. They, they say in the wiki article that the media picked it up. No, the conspiracy theorists did. But a just as likely scenario is that spooks exhumed Lockwood's novels from obscurity and worked the room in a 4chan thread, which I think happens more often than not, offering conspiracy theorists first dibs before handing the leftovers over to the normies via the news, the usual order of events. Well, here is some information about the books. The Lockwood Fellow was a lawyer and, for a time, America's consul to the kingdom of Hanover, which is a modern Deutschland, or a section, a state of it, appointed by none other than Abraham Lincoln. He eventually got around to publishing two children's books. His first, The Travels and Adventures of Little Baron Trump and his wonderful dog, Bolger, was released in 1890. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey was its 1893 follow-up. There was yet another book published three years later in 1896. That one was provocatively, pro, provocatively titled 1900 or The Last President. We shall have to take a closer look at that one for sure. The Baron Trump novels recount the adventures of the German boy Wilhelm Henrik Sebastian von Trump who simply goes by Baron Trump. Supposing you're already lost to the parallels being proposed, Baron Trump is Donald Trump's only child with First Lady Melania. Mind you, that is only where similarities between Trump's son and the fictional Trump begin. There are others. Little Baron Trump is described as deriving from a wealthy family that lives on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and what is furthermore referred to as, I kid you not, Trump Castle. If you need to spill out for you, Baron Trump was raised in Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, New York City. The, the plot, and there, there's a, a sketch of him there from the book. The plot follows Little Baron and his dog Bolger on a series of Wonderland like nonsense adventures through other dimensions and time with the help of a mystical character named Don Foom. Oh, <laughs> I almost have to wonder if that's like. Referring to the Don. Don helps Baron and Bulger find the portal to his world within a world that eventually leads them to, wait for it, Russia. You've got to be kidding me. As if portals and parallel dimensions were even a thing back then. Seriously, what child was on the schoolyard discussing string theory in the multiverse in 1890? The adventures of Little Baron Trump may have lifted its inspiration from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but the intended pretense of nonsense literature, which was undoubtedly popular at the time, is probably just that, a convenience gu uh, convenient guise. Follow the wiki link that I earlier showed you, and it describes Trump's adventures as one wherein he discovers weird, uh, quote, uh, quote, unquote, weird underground civilizations, offends the natives, LOL, <laughs> flees from his entanglements with local women, again, LOL, and repeats this pattern until arriving back home at Castle Trump. Sounds like the Trump administration we've come to know. 
Even the physical similarities between barren and barren cannot be ignored. If one is an incidence and two a coincidence and three starting to resemble a pattern, well, onto your fourth or your fifth then. Trump has never been fond of pets. And in fact, the media made a point of hammering that little tidbit out soon after his election in 2016, probably in hopes of dehumanizing him. We don't need to, we all know that. Had he entered the White House without one, he would have been the first president to do so in 150 years. He did arrive with the dog, though, though I don't think it was ever really reported on again. Uh, the details given to us by the same media reports, such as this article in The Sun, though it appears to have originated with The Washington Post, make the Baron Bolger connection all that much more of a potent one. While attending a Thanksgiving event at the Trump's Mar-a-Lago home, philanthropist Lois Pope showed Donald a picture of the nine-week-old golden doodle she was raising. Apparently, Trump instructed her to show Barron the, the pooch picture, uh, by which he cried immediately. There is your first Barron bugle, uh, or I should say, that should say Bulger. I don't know a bugle connection. Barron Trump's dog goes by the name of Patton as in four-star general George S. Patton. Why would Barron's fictional dog from the novel be named Bolger then? It is carefully coded. Patton was an instrumental factor in the Allies' victory at the Battle of the Bulge. There is your Bolger connection. As mentioned earlier, Lockwood's final novel was 1900 or The Last President, and you'll never guess what the plot involves. It begins in November, election season. New York City is in chaos while anarchists protest a corrupt election process wherein a hugely unpopular outsider candidate wins his ticket into the White House. And then look at what we read. Mobs of vast size are organizing under the lead of anarchists and socialists and threaten to plunder and despoil the houses of the rich who have wronged and oppressed them for so many years. The Fifth Avenue Hotel will be the first to feel the fury of the mob. Though Baron Trump is no longer present this time around, Lockwood once again begins his narrative at Fifth Avenue at a Fifth Avenue hotel, precisely where Trump Tower now stands. The paperback is only 52 pages. It's very difficult not seeing a 9-11 style predictive programming in all of this. You will tell me Donald Trump wasn't the last president. Joe Biden arrived with dementia after him, making Lockwood's book a failed prediction. Is that so? My QN and friends will say Trump was the last president and, in fact, still is president. That's a whole different thing. And that, at the very least, Biden is a puppet president, an idea which I can most certainly get behind. He is definitely a puppet president. But then with dim dementia and all sorts of <laughs> just hand the guy his ice cream. But then there is another option on the table. We have not seen the last of President Trump. Understand then what I'm not suggesting. I am not insinuating that Donald Trump is in any way an interdimensional time travel traveler. I'm not even thinking that, just you know. It sounds silly even mentioning that, though you are free to come to your own conclusions. They are simply not my own. Who really knows what the future has in store for Baron, though? Given what I have already shown you with the Back to the Future movies, the mysterious placement of Lockwood's novels may indeed be explained by time travel. I am positing the possibility that they were placed there only after the fact, which is why nobody knew about them until 2017. Some of you will tell me it is still a failed prediction all the same, and you are probably right about that. But then you will have to consider the many divergences and possible outcomes available to us as an ever-accumulating measurement of time interacts with the multiverse. Just because Trump is the final president in one or any number of other timelines doesn't mean he will be in our own. With 9-11, we were given a 30-year heads up. There was definitely room for a percentage error, but it was probably a small one compared with the added padding of 120 years. In slightly other news, Pepe the Frog became an internet sensation under the guided hand of the Trump administration very early on in the game as well. Trump depicted himself as Pepe in a tweet dating back to 10-13-2015, a month before his presidential win. Within the year, the Anti-Defamation League included Pepe in their database of hate symbols. I think a lot of you probably remember that news. Right alongside the swastika, LOL. 
In 2017, Pepe's creator, Matt Fury, even depicted the frog in a coffin, hoping to crush the rebellion once and for all, LOL, again. Well, oddly enough, Pepe the Frog has also been identified as the Egyptian Elohim kick, though usually as a running joke. Is it, though? A joke is only so funny as it is true. Kick was depicted as a frog-headed hieroglyph and was worshipped for his magical abilities as they pertain to time. Technically, Keck was an androgynous deity. His female counterpart was known as Kokket, which is simply the feminine of Keck. Both ultimately played the same role. They were a balancing act for the chaos and the void. Kokket was a snake-headed woman, lovely, called the Bringer In of the Darkness, who presided over the hours of twilight when the sun was setting. Her masculine frog counterpart, however, was the Elohim of the hours before dawn and was known as Bringer In of the Light, as he guided the sun barge of Ra towards the sky from the underworld. I take it that Kokit is Killery then. Pepe the Frog's relation to the Egyptian Elohim of time and chaos may be a new uh, insight in these parts, though the discussion is an ongoing one. Try not to forget that I already covered Trump's role in the left and the right hand pendulum swing of magic some years ago. The Wizard of Trump formally came to my attention during a Marina Abro, uh, Abramovic, Marina Abramovic interview held on stage of all places. And this is what she said. If you don't know who she is, Marina Abramovic, she's a, a spirit cooker amongst many other things, uh, a performance artist, witch, kind of like Yoko Ono. And this is what she said. In Lapland, there is a group of them in the shamans there who do something called collective dreaming. They will get together in seclusion and do rituals, which with, you know, eating very little food and being in solitude for a long time. And they will go and dream the dreams. And the dream have to be called the same dream. Now, keep on. She's kind of speaking here with like a, an accent. I don't think English is her first language, so it's a little spotty uh, or sounds a little bit off. So coming out of this dream, this one shaman told me that actually the best thing happened is in this planet right now is the Trump is uh, Trump to be president. I said, how is this possibly the best thing to happen? He said, yes, because because he's so irrational. He's so crazy that it's actually that it's actually creates the awakening that we finally wake up because before we have another guy and another guy and everything is similar, but he's so different than anything else. So actually he's the magician who is waking us up. Abramovic's visit with the Finnish shamans happened presumably while our paper thin narrative and the Mandela effect were holding hands as part of the tight wire act in 2016. One of them explained to her the purpose of the Trump presidency. They had gotten together in ritualistic seclusion, eating very little, dreaming dreams, and then it happens. They dream the same dream in a decade inhabited by collective false memories. Trump was brought onto the scene to create the awakening. And then she said it. Marina Abramovic actually went there. She called Donald Trump a magician. A magician, in case you were unaware, is someone who manipulates the natural world through alchemical means so as to lead people towards enlightenment, or contrarily, into the darkness. Kind of like Pepe the Frog. Also, despite her quote-unquote surprise in all of this, Abramovic is somewhat of a magician herself. But just as importantly, she's a performance artist for the elite and knows the script even when she's acting the part of improv and of course, she's well-connected with Bill Gates and all those dudes. First and foremost, Abramovic is directing our attention to Tarot, of which the magician card is numbered one on the list. It's not a coincidence that The Economist made the very comparison in December of 2016 after her interview. The magician is associated with Mercury, alchemy. Uh, he is seen standing with one arm stretched upwards towards the universe, the other pointing down towards Earth, connecting the spiritual realm with the material, as above, so below. It is therefore the magician who uses the symbiotic relationship as an intercessor to create and manifest his goals in the physical realm. He is the conduit by which energy is converted into matter. The typical magician tarot depicts four items on the table before him, a cup, a pentacle, sword, and wand. 
They are the four elements, water, earth, air, and fire. The economist substitutes these symbols for four houses, which the magician is creating from a 3D printer, and the, the virtual reality goggles reminds us that everything is an illusion. The typical magician card depicts a bilt which doubles as an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. You see, time is in the cards after all. The economist, however, keeps to the infinity symbol above his head. It reminds us of the number eight, as in 88 miles per hour required for the flux capacitor to do its work. We are hereby reminded that Trump wields unlimited eternal resources to implode and expand the material realm. But then notice what she did there. She called him crazy and irrational. That tells us she's referencing the fool card as well. The fool is numbered zero in the deck, but don't make uh, don't mistake him for a nobody. The crossroads are expanded whenever and wherever he shows up. That's why he's first in the deck. His equivalent is the trickster, whom I have already discussed when comparing Marty McFly and Doc Brown's success in stealing lightning from Zeus's bolt at 88 miles per hour, thereby manipulate, uh, thereby manipulate the laws of time as we know it. And, of course, Trump equals 88 in simple English to Matria. Coincidence, I'm sure. Not so long ago, Microsoft's co-founder, Bill Gates, who I mentioned is in cohorts with, Abimel uh, with Marina, the spirit cooker, referred to Apple founders, uh, founder Steve Jobs as a wizard. Yeah, you heard me right. America's favorite nerd confessed to the hidden game to Bloomberg, but we're all expected to take it as Dungeons and Dragons talk. And this is what he said to Bloomberg. I was like a minor wizard because he would be casting spells and I would see people mesmerized. Because I'm a minor wizard, that's the spells don't work on me. I could not cast those spells, but I'd see them and I'd say, hey, don't. <laughs> Wait, so is the is the VAX Grand Master Pent telling us that Stevie's wizard is larger than his? How did he put it again? Minor wizard, is it? Hmm. That's how I'm taking it unless somebody can explain this conundrum using another analogy. Or is he simply referring to the size of a wizard's wand? Yes, that must be it. One can never really navigate through these conversations without having to comment upon the obelisk the wizards of our world all um, are waving around. And since we're on the subject, just look at Trump, why don't you? Such irrelevance towards the big fat appendage they built, resembling a middle finger pointed towards heaven. He's on his cell phone. I'd very much like to know what he's tweeting about this time. One and zero, fool and magician, Donald Trump, the greatest waker-upper of our time. The point to all of this is that there is the left hand and the right hand of magic, the checkerboard duality, and it is a world run by wizards that we inhabit. I am reminded of that scene in the 1902 science fiction uh, movie, A Trip to the Moon, wherein wizards deceive the normies into thinking they're scientists before heading out on their magical journey. Astral projection, is it? They straight up told us how, we, how it would be done some 67 years before the Apollo mission. Though in the case of the moon landing, it was filmed in a Hollywood basement, obviously. The Lookout Mountain Film Studio is more like it. I figure somebody out there on this motionless plane needed to hear that. According to Bill Gates, they're casting spells. Tell me something I don't know already. The question of the hour is whether or not wizards are circumnavigating the lower dimensions to manipulate the physical world around us. For a while there, I wasn't even convinced that time is a dimension. Leave it to the Mandela effect to convince me. The sheer repulsion and, in fact, utter disdain we have witnessed by the elites and their media mouthpieces may frame our current circumstances in a completely different light, particularly if the knowledge of future outcomes is thrown into the equation and known, a psyop so grand that even time is a tool for manipulation. Perhaps their season is running short, and what's more, controllers know it. What can they do to extend the inevitable, I wonder? All timelines may converge with the same end, but not necessarily at the exact mile marker. Then again, amongst all that rage of theirs, they should be careful. There is something referred to as a self-fulfilling prophecy. All right. Moving into some Mandela effects. I'll give this like another 20 minutes and then we'll open up for discussion. Hopefully you guys are all still tracking with me.
there'll always be the Berenstein, 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 Berenstein bears to me. You'll see why I call it three different things in a moment here. Murdoch is being especially difficult this morning and refusing to recognize Berenstein as a proper word. I will have you know it is not misspelled and refuse to apologize for it. They're in on the whole operation, obviously, Microsoft. You think that somewhere in the world there would be a Berenstein family with an E rather than an A, if not for the bears, but it seems as though they're doubling down on the exclusivity. I checked. Berenstein is a Jewish name. Gulp. Look who the racist is now, word doc. You'd better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Turns out the system is manually overridden as of a moment ago because I'm living the life as a keyboard warrior and have permanently corrected the spelling on my computer. You will have to do the same on your end. Don't expect a medal of honor, though. The Baron Stain Bears will always be Baron Stein to me, even if they are bears of the lesser known Ashkenazi variety. That's how the entire Mandela effect appears to have begun, you know. Well, technically, it started with a man named Nelson Mandela. You may have heard of him, but it is the Berenstein Bears which gave it the legs to run. Leave it to the Berenstein Bears, of all things. I, I know why they didn't call it the Berenstein effect now. Too many people would have been clued into this being a Jewish operation. Oops. Enough of that now. That's just like me to enter a perfectly fun party and ruin the mood. It's just that they already run the media, you know, if the shoes fit, but I digress. You will have a terribly difficult time convincing nearly any 80s child, such as myself, that it wasn't Stein, mostly because we would stand around on the playground having arguments on how to pronounce it. Stein like Frankenstein or Steen as in Seen. And yes, I was personally involved in the debate on, the, on at least one occasion, likely moments before... Uh, dodgeball diplomacy. Nobody is having that argument with stain, as in they stain their pants. Nobody. That is all the proof you need, but I will show you some residue anyways. The story made headway on 8-5-2016 when a Reddit user claimed she'd been packing with her husband only to discover that an old VHS tape still had Baron Stein. I, I, I can't even get all the pronunciations right. Baron Stein printed upon the sticker. Another another user by the name of Jump Jumpsy uh, Daisy then responded, ran it through some basic analysis looking for editing, and if it is an edit, then it's a really good one because it doesn't show any traces at all, just putting that out there. I managed a screenshot of that too. I'm cutting them out and pasting them onto the page because these web pages get often deleted. Mandela Effect promoters and deniers alike began scrambling to their attics to see if any of the books and VHS tapes saved from their childhood had survived the purge. Well, I'm here to tell you that the Berenstein or Berenstein bears have reached a near extinction level event. It's total genocide. I have seen so little residue emerge that I can probably count them on one hand. A VHS tape, ticket stub, coupon, a supposed listing and TV guide, though I think that one could have even been doctored, not sure. And then something having to do with the Simpsons. Make it two hands then. Everything reads Berenstain now. Adding to this mystery is Mike Berenstain, son of the original author Stan and Jan Berenstain, who has continued the series and claims he was always a Berenstain, despite what his readership claims. But we know better. To be honest, if it weren't for the overwhelming evidence of the Mandela effect in other areas, or in the case of the Bears, my own childhood memory, uh, the childhood memory of millions, no doubt, I would have little choice but to claim each of these physical examples were delivered by spooks. Uh, the ones like the ticket stub and all that kind of stuff and the VHS tape. And they may very well have uh, been for all I know. Somebody had to get the PSYOP rolling, and the Intel community isn't one to sit around waiting for somebody to pull up a Berenstein book at the garage sale. Speaking of which, a woman finally got around to digging one such copy, digging up one such copy. She made a YouTube video regarding her discovery, but very few seemed to notice at first. Read it and weep, it says, Berenstein, written precisely as... Uh, us 80s children remember. By the way, it's not a misprint. I would have taken a screenshot of the back of the book where it lists off other Berenstein books in the series, but the woman's finger was there, and there's, if there's anything I can't stand, it's pictures of a finger pointing at something. 
Please stop taking pictures with your finger pointing at something. I can't stand them. I say this to myself as much as everyone. Leave your finger out of it. I'm perfectly capable of directing my eyes at a minute detail without your finger pointing the way and ruining a perfectly good shot. Therefore, I will make you do your own work. You have to track down her video and chance a possible irrational dislike of finger portraits for yourself if it's further proof you're after. There are varying theories out there as to why so few material relics remained as we remember them. You don't have to search very far into the ME to learn that a clash of dimensions is one of them. Though if you want my personal opinion on it, I simply think they wanted to be found. That's the gaslighting part of the operation. Also, the people who are pushing the multiverse explanation have a habit of being NASA as well as pop culture fanboys. Uh, the part, and of course, you know, I think it's a very well possible. I'm just saying there's a lot of NASA fans in this. The part that they're missing is our controller's hand in practically everything from the ground floor up, particularly in the magic. I was able to track down th that Simpsons reference, and it appears to derive from the 1130-2003 episode, The Fats and the Fur uh, Furious. It aired nearly 20 years ago as of this writing which just so happens to be about when I last tuned in. If you are still interested in my theory, I'm thinking the Simpsons always called them Berenstain with an A to be funny, but also to avoid the, li the, the liars, the, that was a, a Freudian thing, uh, avoid the lawyers while playing the game of parody. The irony would be that the Berenstain Bears became the very product which the Simpsons taunted thereby making the ongoing predictive programming of creator Matt Groening even more of a Masonic mystery. Until somebody else can d dig up something better, the very best residue I've so far seen, hands down, derives from the 1-12-2012 episode of The Office. It's the one that had many speculating Steve Carell returned undercover to play on a trivia team called the Quarenstein Bears after leaving the show one season earlier which is exactly the sort of name that his character would come up with, by the way. Had the Berenstein Bears always been Berenstain with an A, then the joke wouldn't have been a potent one. It certainly wouldn't have stuck the landing. I will leave you with links to the discussion here, here, and here. The Huffington and the Washington Post, as well as Vulture and dozens of other media sites, were so busy working to debunk the purported appearance by Steve Carell that nobody thought to bring up the Stein in... Quirinstein wasn't an issue. It's probably, it probably has something to do with everyone having the same memory at the time. Nobody was out there challenging the issue until people began to notice there was a purge and that Jewish bears were involved. And then suddenly it was all chalked up to bad memory. It's all projection, though. The only people with bad memory appear to be the ones refusing to let the comforts of their frail reality get challenged. All right, going to do a couple more here. This is, oh, Feel the Difference, the Ford logo. That's one of their, you know, their models, Feel the Difference, back in the day. I don't think they use that anymore. But I have definitely felt the difference. Dissenters repeatedly tell me the Mandela effect is nothing more or less than the power of suggestion. The power of suggestion is when an individual has an idea conveyed to them, and that idea in turn becomes reality. Oh, I get it. I see what they did there. They're making a joke at my expense. It's their way of saying their mind is too strong to be broken by a Jedi mind trick, unlike my own. Sure, that must be it. Personally, I think it takes a strong mind to recognize an irregularity and then cope with the implications. Experience has shown that most people are incapable of doing that. They will correctly remember things the way they were until they are shown to be an error, in which case they will slump into the herd mentality. And anyway, so far, I have committed no such deed. I haven't handed you over to any power of suggestion that I can recall, at least not here for the Ford logo. My only transgression thus far is titling this section the Ford logo. But even that came in the wake of photographic evidence detailing the said logo through the years. It is up to you to figure out what, if anything, has gone awry. We're on the bottom of page 64 if you need caught up. I offer you further evidence that Ford has a logo and that it has remained consistent throughout the years. Nothing wrong with that. All we are doing right now is observing the obvious. I'm also curious if anything looks so, I don't know, different to you. It did for me the moment I laid eyes upon it, and nobody had to suggest anything. You might even say my journey with the Mandela Effect began with the Ford logo. 
It might have been Back to the Future, but it was really the Ford logo. There were other alterations that had caught my notice, like the Isaiah 11 6 passage or the Terrace fan in Back to the Future. And even the uh, Berenstain, Berenstain Bears gave me a dark and foreboding feeling. Ford, however, is what really got the ball rolling. The date was August 2nd, 2015. I'll never, I'll never forget it. I remember the day well because we were hightailing it out of California. We'd actually left the day before. We were driving eastward beyond Yuma, having only moments ago uh, earlier crossed the California-Arizona border. By we, I include my wife and our toddler twin sons. The house was sold along with most of our possessions, and we'd started off on the next great adventure only a day earlier, following Yao, but not knowing where we would ultimately end up. And we, by the way, drove across America for like nine months until he finally planted us down in Charleston. We just went day by day, week by week, not knowing where we were going to end up, praying our, our way through it. Well, driving through Arizona and New Mexico in the sweltering heat of the summer and I don't know if I'll ever do a Texas in August again voluntarily, unless if I'm living there. Um, well, it gives ample time for a man to think. It was there in the desert that I noticed the Ford logo on the truck in front of me and thought, huh, I don't remember that little pigtail on the F before. It used to have more of a straight line to it, kind of like a, you know, less of a pigtail, a little bit of a wave. My first thought was that they changed the logo and that it was a lame alteration. More specifically, that Ford had rebranded its signature or whatever. And so, uh, or ironically, we were driving a Ford, an F-350, if you must know. And so I made sure to check out the grill after we'd parked for the night. But even ours had the same pigtail scribbled upon it. Strange. How had I been so oblivious to the change when I had purchased the truck a few weeks earlier? When had Ford rebranded and why hadn't I heard about it? My head swirled with dark and uncomfortable questions. Just so we're clear, I had never heard of the Mandela effect before. It was already around by then. Uh, the records will show that people were talking about it, though the changes were, were likely still in the cradle of their infancy. And that's just the thing. I'd never heard of it. Nobody had, nobody had sat me down and explained to me how every Ford logo in the history of the automobile industry changed to a pigtail. They didn't need to. I simply noticed that something was off, a glitch if you want to call it that. I just didn't know what to do with it. So you can't tell me I fell for the power of suggestion. The only person who suggested a change was myself, and some months later, when I finally learned that the Mandela Effect was a thing, those observations lined up with everybody else's. Incredible how that works. It is a well-known fact that the logo is based upon Henry Ford's own handwritten signature. The Ford Motor Company even insists that the original design is still in use today. Well, that's strange. Numerous examples uh, can be found online, and though there are slight variations, as one would rightfully expect of any signature, not one of them contains the curly pigtail. That is to say, if Henry Ford ever signed his name with the obnoxious pigtail, then the Ford Motor Company has yet to cough up the evidence. Who knows, that might change in the next few years. What is especially strange in all of this is the 1909 logo, which does resemble Ford's signature in so much that the F is completely absent of the you-know-what. But then starting in 1911, the, big, the pigtail was introduced and every signature thereafter followed suit. History has been rewritten. The elephant in the room is that, very, uh, is the, is that the very people who insist the logo has been rebranded are ultimately admitting that they too remember the old one. That being said, there is residue to be found, but in nearly every instance, the logo is hand-sketched or painted on by car mechanics, all of whom are drawing from their memory. I could show them to you, but then that would be a rookie mistake. Been there, done that. I would be accused of killing trees because the deniers will claim the only thing that is being proven is that a host of car mechanics never really took a closer look under the hood, if you know what I mean. Ridiculous. Leave it to the Ministry of Truth to set the mechanics straight on this one. I'm still waiting for the claim that mechanics are just really into the 1909 model and that they simply don't make engines like they used to. The best residue that I've so far stumbled upon derives from an episode of Jay Leno's Garage. I'm, I'll link it to you here. The featured car this time around is a 1967 Ford Fairlane. You can see the original logo after they pop open the hood at the 2039 mark. Beautiful, ain't it? Precisely as I recall the Ford experience on the front grille of hundreds of thousands of automobiles cruising the lanes of America. 
the sheer amount of denial is truly baffling. Apparently, even the Ford Motor Company is joining the masses and collectively misremembering their own logo this time around. I actually take that back. Jay Leno's garage is not the best residue I've seen. No, this is by far the better of the bunch. I'd simply forgotten about it since originally watching the footage some years back. I'm not sure what the model is, though. Uh, the, the make is, though the make is obviously Ford. If I had to guess, we're looking at a 1944 deluxe sedan, though it has become known by a far more colorful name, the car caught between universes. The reason being is that the front of the car shows the modern logo, as we all know it now, the pigtail, whereas the rear has miraculously preserved Ford's signature, the way we remember it, and the way Ford actually signed his name. You can view the video for yourself if you'd like. The person who made the discovery shows the entire car in one take, front to back, so that there are no claims to funny business. How the back half of the car survived the purge can only be explained by a glitch in the matrix. All right, waking up in a jiffy. We'll do a couple more. Supposing you have ever attempted to hold the bread and circuses conversation with a sports addict during the fourth quarter of the ball game, then you know what it's like poking a bear in the butt during its hibernating season. Don't do that. In all honesty, I never know what it will take to wake the normies up from their slumber. If the Federal Reserve or the faked Apollo moon landings, stolen his story, the flat earth, media hoaxes or pharmaceutical witchcraft and the VA, VAX don't, uh, don't raise a brow, don't do raise a brow, then Jif peanut butter just might do the trick. You never really know. It's best to keep your options open. Always be on the lookout for that opportune moment to jump into the conversation. It was like that during an exchange I was having with someone a few months ago. Our communication was an ongoing one lasting several days around the fireside. I was living on the beach in Florida at the time, and nothing that I said to this individual was getting through. But then he said it. He said, Jiffy peanut butter, and I was on it. I was quick to the trigger and said, Jiffy peanut butter never existed. It's called Jiff, and it's always been Jiff. Why people keep calling it Jiffy is strange, don't you think? He, his response was immediate one. Bull S blank blank T. This is a family show, so you, you could see what he told me. It wasn't nice. Well, then, if you don't believe me, look it up, was my response. They've rebranded, that's all, he explained. Oh, is that so? Well, do a Google search on Jiffy going all the way back to the beginning. It's Jiff, and it's always been Jiff. Jiffy is a collective false memory, and it's never existed. That's what I told him. I then introduced him to something called the Mandela Effect, and he was hooked. Nabbed one. Another seat from the Coliseum emptied. The world is that much more woke now. You're welcome. Of the many changes to company or corporate logos, the Jiffy GIF swap is indeed an interesting one because we're first and foremost dealing in missing letters, making this a spatial issue. I am showing you several vintage ads and they all look the same. It is mostly the way in which GIF is laid out which bothers me, filling every empty space on the page. The J and the I and the F would have to be substantially smaller to make room for an added F and a Y as I remember it. But then there is the color issue red, blue, and green. Each letter receives its own color, with the green being the only non-primary. Well, I personally don't recall any other colors. It was always blue, red, and green in my reality. How would the letter arrangement work then if they are each given their own disjointed rectangle to work with, and there are only three of them? I'm glad you ask. I can't speak for the earlier ads, obviously, being a Gen Xer. And so here is a magazine spread from the whereabouts of 1980, which I can get excited about. Color-wise, it is precisely how I remember the bottle staring back at me during the nostalgic moments of my childhood. Because who doesn't have nostalgic uh, memories of peanut butter? The red and blue have traded spaces from what we've seen in earlier renditions. The only thing that is missing is the added F and Y. Really, when it comes down to it, the entire design has changed. Give me a few minutes and I'll show you what it used to look like. The peanut butter Nazis are claiming we're confusing Jiffy with Skippy, but that just goes to show that they've never eaten a Jiffy burger. What diners were they eating in all those decades ago? All the grammatically correct ones, apparently, filled with the other peanut butter Nazis. Well, it was a thing, you know, Jiffy burgers. 
even though we're a decade into the PSYOP and the training is nearly complete, do a Google search for Jiffy peanut butter and you'll find dozens of interesting search results. Also, Google will try to correct you and call it a Jif burger, even though recipe after recipe calls upon Jiffy peanut butter, LOL. Turns out Fanny Ann Saloon in Old Town, Sacramento still has Jiffy peanut butter on their menu or in the very least until the peanut butter police show up and they cave to the collective false memory arguments. Yep, that's it right there. The mischievous Jiffy peanut butter person with a butter knife hanging around in the wrong reality up to no good. Precisely as I remember the logo as well. The I and the added F straddles the red and blue and the green. And now all the <laughs> all of this Mandela talk has made me hungry. If you'll excuse me, I actually went and bought peanut butter after this and I ate it because I was so... I so hungry um i'm gonna read one more and i think i will be done for the nights and um, perfect timing we're coming up on two hours this was uh one of the first ones i actually wrote you can see well that survived this one's dated to march 12 2017 and um my i was just gone whack <laughs> after actually the original was much longer i just went on and on and on this long online rant about rants and ravings from the piggly wiggly do you know how many times I've wanted to hold a Kit Kat bar up over my head and shout at the grocery clerk like a crazy madman? It's changed again. It's changed again. I have it, but because then I'd sound like a crazy madman. I've wanted to, though, desperately. See, the problem with Kit Kat, as spellings of logos go, is that it's flipped back and forth between Kit Kat without a dash and Kit Kat with a dash, all in real time and in a maddening game of sanity ping pong. This is the stuff that I pay attention to. I know if I inform the grocery clerk to the truth of the matter that it has indeed changed from a dash to no dash, she'll probably look at me with a crooked face and say, so what? A candy company can change their logo from a dash to no dash if they want to, in which I'll tell her with the wide eyes of a completely sane person, aha, that's where you are wrong. It's because this is yet another example of the Mandela effect, and it's very real. That's just the thing. On any given day, week, or month of the year, I'll be standing here in the checkout aisle of the Piggly Wiggly with my toddler twin son. This is before I went Torah, by the way. With my toddler twin sons, and I'll see Kit Kat spilled with a dash. I'll immediately return home, seek Google's wisdom, and everything about recorded history will tell me it's always and only been spilled with a dash. Of course, there will be some guy in a chat room somewhere asking the question, did anybody see Kit Kat become Kit Kat with a dash again? In which hundreds of others, me included, will be like, um, yeah, it happened for me too. And I just let the grocery clerk in on it. On any other given day, week or month of the year, I'll be standing in the exact same checkout aisle of the Piggly Wiggly, like the bad habit from a horror movie, trying to convince myself not to take a peek at the candy display. But when I do, Kit Kat is spilled without a dash, like today. I'll immediately return home with my twin sons, surf the web with purpose, and do you know what I'll find? Everything about recorded history will tell me it's always and only been spilled without a dash. How much do you want to bet there will be that one guy waiting for me in a chat room to explain it doesn't matter if it's Kit Kat yesterday or Kit Kat today with or without a dash? Whether it's dash status is, whatever it's dash status is on any given day, it has always been that way. I was pushing my grocery cart down the, uh, <laughs> the cereal aisle of the Piggly Wiggly less than an hour ago, and my sons pointed towards a box of Fruit Loops. So I threw the box of Fruit Loops in the cart, remembering when Fruit Loops was spilled, Fruit Loops like the actual fruits and not OO. And before that, when it was Fruit Loops, and still before that, when it was Fruit Loops again. And post edit, yeah, I was still feeding the sugary garbage to my children even then. Look how far I've come. Yes, we don't we don't even touch cereal anymore. We haven't in like four or five years. Why do brand names keep changing all the time? And why does all of recorded history keep conspiring with those changes, including that 80s commercial, the kid eating a bowl of Fruit Loops or Fruit Loops, whatever history presently calls it today? Should I also let the grocery clerk in on the fact that not so long ago, Febreze was spilled with a second E, Febreze, as we all remember it. There's one in every aisle and probably guys like me in every checkout stand. And another thing, not more than a year ago, I was standing here in the Piggly Wiggly, and I clearly recall seeing an article on a certain presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, spilled with only one L, and thinking, huh, that's strange. They misspelled her name. It wasn't just one magazine cover, though. We were doggy paddling through another election season 
where the slave gets to make believe they're selecting their next plantation master. And Clinton was getting amped up by the media everywhere. Except then I made the mistake of going to Google. Hillary Clinton had always spilled, been spilled with one L by all media sources. What in the world? Was even Hillary with two L's on the Clinton uh, on the Clinton hit list? Hillary took her out. It wouldn't be for another month or perhaps only a couple of weeks, really, that Hillary Clinton reemerged in the tabloids with two L's. From the checkout stand at the Piggly Wiggly, that is. Oh, good. The Clintons were back. All was right in the world again. I don't know. Maybe I should just altogether stop shopping at the Piggly Wiggly. Actually, we did. It was the best thing we ever did. <laughs> the whole Kit Kat, Kit Kat de debacle is reason for, for why nobody will ever be able to convince me that the Mandela effect is bad in, in digestion. It's all projection. The people making such claims very well may be the ones incapable of coping with a tampered memory. But I saw it with my own eyes. I was there in the great ping pong war of 2016. That's what we called it in those days, when realities were so frail that they would fluctuate like a corporate pendulum week by week. Funny thing is, I watched Kit Kat uh, ping pong back and forth between a dash and without its dash so often and for so long that I can no longer recall whether it originally had a dash or no dash at all. All right, that's it for tonight. Uh, it's been two hours. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And um, way more writing mistakes than I was hoping for. It was definitely a Rivka effect this week. And um, I'll have you know that I wrote some of those while she had a fever sitting on my lap this week. So... Uh, let me know your guys' thoughts. I hand it over to the jury, the defense rest, and um, let's get the conversation going. Well, I just wanted to say thanks for this presentation, Noel. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in Mandela Effect for quite a while. It's the biggest news story, in my opinion, that isn't uh, getting any light shed on it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of explanations for it, but, you know, I, I know, and some of you might've heard this before, but because we've talked about it before, but I used to collect monopoly boards and a big one for me was the monopoly man, not having a monocle. He always had a monocle. I collected the boards. I went to McDonald's when I was younger. I, you know, they had the monopoly. Uh, time of the year where you put the stickers on the board and you try to get them all so you can get extra things and money and everything. So um, people that don't think this is going on, they're just not paying attention. And or and I want people to be aware that not everybody is affected the same way as everybody else. And we talked about this a little bit before the meetup tonight, uh, because, you know, I might remember the Monopoly man ha having a monocle, but for somebody here, they might not remember that. And that's okay. It's just a different, you know, timeline or parallel dimension, you could say, uh, that got overlapped. And uh, that's just what you remember. It's we shouldn't look down upon each other or ostracize each other because of it. Uh, we need to keep our focus on the most high and not on these earthly things. However, um, it is real. It is happening. It's not like some weird, obscure thing. And uh, anyways, I, oh, and one more thing. The Ford logo. I, I remember it, how hardly anybody remembers it that I've seen and it's with the curly cue, but the, instead of the curly cue going up, it goes down and into the O and curls around into the O. And I don't think anybody that I've seen on here or anywhere else has, has described it like that, but it actually fits perfectly into that little space on the O and it curls right into the O. Um, so. Anyways, that's my thoughts. You, uh, Andrew, you described it as like the biggest story uh, that's not getting coverage or something like that. And so I want you guys all to know that 
I, I started out explaining that I I kind of recreated this paper a year ago uh, when I saw that CERN was firing up the engines again. And at that time, it was only like 50 pages. And I, I, I put something out there to have something. Uh, but as I started dusting it off and really covering it like two or three weeks ago, uh, I, I didn't realize i mean i have been just writing and writing and writing more content material for the last two or three weeks i'll probably spend at least another week or two doing this and the more i do it it's kind of like cleaning house um i think this is a good analogy you 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 look at the house and it's dirty and so you start cleaning it and you don't realize how much dust is there until you you start cleaning and cleaning and there's more and more dust you're like oh my goodness and i did not realize all the years i've been looking at this i did not realize how big of a story, how important of a story this truly is until I've been writing it and going and just being overwhelmed at how much of our rea our perceived reality is easily tampered and manipulated. And, you know, the, the time itself is like a, a this construct that we hold so dear, right? That, you know, that's, you just count back the years and you know, all the holidays and all the memories and stuff like that. And just going, what do they have in store for us in the future? I think there's probably a time coming. I don't know if it's sooner rather than later or at a later hour. I don't really know. There's a time coming that the Mandela effect's not even going to be talked about anymore. I mean, that's, it's going to be like, it's going to be common knowledge, like, like Kim trailing. It'll be something like, it won't even be like, I told you so. Just like, they just won't give us, you know, they, oh, we believe it now because the media told us, you know, we, we know it now because CERN told us, not because the conspiracy theorists told us. It's going to be common knowledge. And I just think, you know, as we get more into like the AI culture and all that kind of stuff, it, uh, our whole sense of reality is just going to be so disjointed. So anyways, enough of me uh, rambling. Uh, what um, are you guys' thoughts? You, you know, when you first started this presentation, and you started talking about CERN and uh, how time and about time travel. I instantly got a flashback of that movie um, Interstellar. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but how he come, you know, he goes off and then he comes back and and he's literally pushing, you know, sending messages to himself by pushing books, you know, you know, at the, at the beginning of the movie, there's, there's this weird thing that happens where books are falling off the shelf and, you know, he gets this message or something and he takes off into space, which is hilarious, of course, and comes back and it's him that's actually pushing the books off to tell himself, you know, not to go or wh whatever it was. But, I just kind of wanted to know if if you think that that's maybe their truth in plain sight of of how they're doing it, you know, except it's not really, you know, space. It, but, you know, that whole thing talks about time travel. That you know, movie. I'm slightly ashamed to admit I have never seen that Christopher Nolan movie. And it's it's been on my list for years and it just I've never watched it. So um, I have, though, recently while researching this started to watch more of like the the portal time travel stories and stuff and i watched the like the first doctor strange movie and the the recent like into the uh the recent spider-man one and stuff like that and uh but i i have that on my list i do want to watch that maybe somebody else can comment on it not an interstellar but i'd like to go back to something that you said from the start um I too got into it about 2016, uh, Mandela Effect, uh, and uh, I hear what you said when uh, it wasn't going over well with people in the flat Earth community. Um, well, they were too intrigued in their own uh, mysteries, but by 2018, after a couple of years of looking into Mandela Effect, um, I realized when I the more I moved away from the flat Earth you know, conferences and uh, people and uh, uh, movement, I got more and more into Mandela effect, but I started co concentrating not so much on all the different Mandela effects, but only on Bible Mandela effects. And, um, and since that time, so it's been quite a few years, I'm studying this psychology behind it. A couple other people have mentioned in here that it's like a psyop within a psyop to do a cover up on a mistake. 
uh, maybe a singularity effect that happened because of CERN. So it they made it into uh, disinformation and misinformation to uh, discredit truthers. And that might have been uh, the uh, agenda to as part of the cover up. But uh, I think maybe what it could have been originally is what you said earlier about a time travel effect. You go back and you look at the Philadelphia experiment, it's kind of hard to imagine with all the evidence that we have that that really did happen, that you, the uh, United States government has been uh, experimenting with this uh, long before the CERN uh, portals, uh, which I believe have been uh, happening for thousands of years anyway. But if you look at... Uh, the different types of uh, Mandela effects. Um, I think we could have been having Mandela effects and, you know, cross dimensions as part of uh, the deceptions and the mysteries that uh, even have been uh, uh, put on us by, or that uh, Yah has allowed to deceive the whole world. And that might've been part of it as well. But going back to, the original Mandela effects, I think if you look at the Mandela effect was coming out at the same time as even the Torah movement, the um, uh, what we know of it in this iteration today, Flat Earth, this giant awakening, all of these things were happening all at the same time. Whether they started happening in 2012 and we started noticing them more in 2016 or not. But what you originally said is you can go back and look up the uh, Googling uh, of, uh, 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 and I think it was in 2014 and 2015, you would see that there were only about 1,100 hits on Google for people querying about Mandela Effect. And then by 2016, it was all, already a million, and then 10 million in the next couple of years. So the advent or the awakening of it and people getting curious about it started happening exponentially at that time to where now where I think it's pretty much uh, covered the world and everybody knows about this uh, so-called conspiracy theory. But taking that into consideration, I think um, it might have been just that when they went back in time. Oh, and also before I forget, let me interject here. I did post a, a video, and I'll put it back up, of the Vatican's uh, Time Machine Viewer. I don't know if you know about that, Noel. Also, um, so looking back at it, what if this was only to discredit the Bible and the Word of God and everything else with singularities and problems that arose from them tampering with the Word? And that's how this all began. That's my uh, hypothesis. That's good stuff. Thank you for uh, throwing that in there. Now, in the perhaps next week, because this is going to be at least a two-parter, and um, there's a lot to talk about. I'm trying to look at my notes here. They're gone. Uh, I'll be bringing up the uh, the the potential time traveler, uh, John uh, Teeter, and I'll just let you guys know uh, this will you know whenever you have an opinion on this stuff there's always that one person who's offended that's it i'm not listening to you anymore I'm, i am of the opinion that so john the teeter thing from like 1998 to 2001 was a apparent chime traveler on the internet that was telling us about the future um and he i'll be talking more about this and he talks about how uh cern is the one that invents it there's a lot of very fascinating things about what he talks about um, I'm of the opinion that he was not a legitimate time traveler, that it was a hoax, uh, but that it was put out there by Intel. Um, and if you guys know how I think and process things, that many of the conspiracy theories that we go with are actually fed to us by Intel. They're the ones actually giving it to us um, to serve their purposes. Um, it's, it's, they're obviously controlling both sides. Um, that's just the fact of the matter. It's a little unsettling for some, but it's the way it is. So I think that there's, uh, there's, there's, you know when like people are like that guy's that guy's a spook. Don't listen to him. He's a shell or whatever. It's like well maybe he's actually feeding us information, right? Um, maybe there's there's a reason why he's there. 
And so um, that, that's my opinion on that. And But I bring that up because he talked about how when you he, – he apparently came from the year 2036, and he, he arrived in 1998. I'll talk more about that later. But he talked about how when he made the, the 30-year jump – that he noticed like a four to five percent difference just in the past from what uh, existed before, and it has to do with string theory and all that kind of stuff. And and he said that you couldn't travel even a thousand years in the past. He actually specifically noted that you could, if you were to travel back. I thought this was interesting. He said if you were to travel back to the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, it would look very different than what history records. Well, isn't that interesting? Now he he was he was basically saying that all of history would look nothing like official history. So there might be a lot of truth to that. The the explanation that he gives, well, obviously I know that there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, the explanation that he gives is that uh, there would be too much variation, and um, so like if you were to try to uh, change something in the in the past 150 years ago. Um, it wouldn't. It, it would be so much of a variation that it wouldn't work out the way you wanted it to. You have like these like thirty uh, year windows, is what he would say, and I, I I actually think that's really interesting because, again, the way he described it, uh, according to CERN, is that they didn't straight out say it, but it seemed like that Yah put up these protective barriers. They actually said that nothing exists beyond the year two thousand five hundred. Nothing exists. Just blank wall darkness. Nothing there. And and so it's it's almost like the firmament or Antarctica. I think that Yah has put these protective barriers up that you could toy around with the short season, which is, I think this all adds up to the short season. Uh, but you can't go back to you know you know murder Adam and Eve. You know you can't go back and you know, ch you know like you know be a lawyer for Yahusha at his trial and get him off the hook. Like you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. So. I just yeah. have one, a couple of comments. The one thing that I really makes you go through is feeling very loopy and unsure of yourself going through all of these Mandela effects. Um, there was this movie called Memory and the man had to like write himself notes all the time because he kept going through this same thing and he didn't know his reality. So to get through and solve this crime, he had to go off photos and pictures. And anyway, it, it, and going through all this, like I have owned two Fords and it made me wonder, well, what was that logo? And why isn't that just like burned in my brain? And then after seeing the one I think it is, Anyway, I just really think that it's to um, make yourself feel unsure of your reality. And I just experienced a personal one yesterday. I'm having all this electrical work done and I have an extension cord. It's new, it's like a super strong, crazy one, right? Where it lights up on both ends. I plugged it in, the lamp works. I plug it in, it doesn't light up. I plug it into another one, it doesn't light up. I tried three different outlets that were all working with other things. And tonight with just going through, you're talking about this, I go under the couch, I get it out, I plug it in and it works. Like what? Crazy, crazy making thinking. Anyway, that's my two cents. Well, I hope I'm not gaslighting you. No. <laughs> no, that was the, my own thing. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Nikki. You know, uh, I, I know this sounds extremely simple, but for me, it goes back to the art of war. And number one thing in the art of war is to divide and conquer, and we see that everything in trump coming on the scene divided america 
more than it's ever been divided since the Civil War, if that even happened. Uh, but it, it's, it's division. It, it is that simple. Divide and conquer, art of war. That's my take on the whole entire thing. I like that there was a cat meowing when you turned your microphone on. And then we heard the rooster. Yeah, he's wanting some breakfast, so. Uh, I would just like to say that it doesn't make me unsure or loopy at all. Um, first of all, I know what I remember. Second, you know, I remember watching a Sinbad movie. Way back in the day, it was called Shazam. They recently released a new one called Shazam. And they had two of them. There was one called Shazam with Sinbad in it. He was a genie. There was one called Kazam with um, Shaq in it. And he was a genie as well. Well, now the Sinbad one does not exist at all. It, it just doesn't. Sinbad says that he, he never made a movie called Shazam. And uh, College Humor released a spoof on it, uh, which Sinbad agreed to do, which is the opening scene for that movie. And it's children that are in a garage and they discover a magic lamp and they rub the lamp and the you know, genie comes out. Sinbad. And one thing that stands out in that little spoof is. They say they can take what they want from us, but they can't take our memories. Now, I know for some it might make people unsure about their reality, but what I would advise you to do is to pay attention to everything. Every little detail in your environment all the time. And if you do that, you'll notice changes. Uh, one that I came across on my own without any you know any uh, before knowledge of prior knowledge of or anything was a uh, quiet riot uh, they sing a song come on feel the noise girls rock the boys but now it says girls rock your boys not the boys some might remember it as your boys. Some might remember it as the boys. But I remember it as the boys. And that's... It, it, it's your boys now. So, Anyways, I, I don't feel unsure about um, my memories. And it's... You know, people can write it off as misremembering something. But not I. So, one thing I, I wanted to throw in there. What Andrew was talking about as well. Is... So when people first discover the Mandela effect, I, it's very unsettling. I, I have to, I, I will admit that of all the truths, and this is one of the reasons I didn't talk about this for years, of all the these so-called truths of these conspiracies that I have discovered, many of them bring me joy and happiness, you know, like learning about uh, the Ruach HaKadosh or the Torah or the Flat Earth, all these things. Learning about the Mandela effect really made me unsettled and it felt very dark. And a lot of people feel that way. It's like, oh, this is icky. I don't want to think about this. You know, that kind of stuff. And it, 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 it really preys on your uh, confidence in obviously reality and makes you feel insecure. And so a lot of people will take these and go, well, that's proof that this is, uh, this is false, that this is a deception. This is all proof of it. And they'll just throw it out. Um, because, you know, y'all would never allow that to happen. He would never, well, why wouldn't he allow it to happen? I mean, we, we saw the same thing happen. Well, we read about it in Genesis 6, that leading up to the flood, all of corruption was, uh, uh, corruption, all of creation was corrupted. And, you know, we talk about the Nephilim, it goes way beyond just these, these hybrids, right? It goes into all the animals that were blended together. And, uh, you know, it, we, we, some people even question, like, we're, we're, for those of you who believe in dinosaurs, and some of you don't, but you know that they were, of course, part of the hybrid thing, and and maybe even pigs themselves, right? Like it was just this corruption that came in. We may be seeing something like that on a much more sophisticated level uh, now, before the next big judgment comes in, right? Where creation itself becomes so corrupted that it it causes Yah to intervene and say, "That's it, I'm done. We're done here. 
but it's going to bring it into it now. Now, I say all this because, yes, at first it brings you a very dark feeling to recognize the things you fit, the baby blankets that I'm not speaking. It was the same way for myself. I'm not speaking down anyway. I'm speaking to myself that, you know, you have this, this baby blanket type of nostalgia to, you know, these movies and these, you know, corporate logos, these different things that you, you took it, you know, took for granted. But as the years go on, you start to sink into it and it just becomes like, it's just normal. Like, yeah, they're changing it. It's what they do. You know, time travel, it, it, it's happened. We're in a time travel movie. And you think about that from um, like a lot of these watching these time travel movies, you watch Back to the Future. Nobody questions that Marty didn't go back 30 years in the past or uh, 100 years to the 1800s or whatever. Nobody questions that. Why? Because you're sitting in the audience. You're watching the one person that is experiencing this. If he were to talk to anybody else, they would all say he's crazy. He, you're, you're crazy. You didn't you didn't do what you said you did. That's that's Luna. Even if you were to show a picture of himself, you know, standing at the clock tower in the 1870s, I go like that. That's. A fake photo that's not real right and that's the way we can watch the two responses from reality and so we can accept the movie but when we suddenly realize that we're living in a movie and that everything is a script and we're on a stage it, it gets really hard and and so eventually you know you just kind of you just kind of work your way into it and you accept it so um you start looking around and go yeah it's a shame it's happening but it's happening and we just it's a good reason to pray to god that, hey come in and intervene let's Let's bring it into this. Like, do we really need to destroy all creation this time, you know, before all of reality, before you come in and save us? So. Any other thoughts? Hey, no, a great, great presentation. But and at the beginning, you were saying something about how you were thinking this upcoming I week have one. could be very. um um like historical i was thinking the same thing too and i was just wondering if you had any guesses on that uh upcoming what uh historical what, can you re you rephrase that like what i said at the beginning you mean like something coming up that makes the mandela effects irrelevant or what or ir irreverence ir irrelevant <laughs> Uh, I don't, I'm not even sure if it was about Mandela effect. I think it was right when you were talking about how just, maybe I interpreted it differently, but kind of like with the, um, tying it into like Trump and he's gotten like, he claims he's going to get arrested now next Thursday. I don't know if you've seen that. And there's just all these bank failures and stuff. And I, I guess that's, maybe I was looking into it too much, but I was, I thought you were alluding to something coming up this week. But maybe, maybe that was oh, yeah. Thing. yeah, beforehand, I was trying to reiterate the point that I did not plan for this. Like, you guys know I don't talk about Trump very often. I, I, I don't think I've ever given a presentation that has included Trump to my knowledge. Or maybe that's a Mandela effect, and I did, and I have no memory of it. But uh, I decided to, you know, just two or three weeks ago, I announced that I was going to be talking about this and I was trying to get this work done on Trump and back to the future and all that. And I had the presentation all ready to go. Um, and it hit the news today that, you know, he came out in a, on a, was it, uh, on his, uh, social media platform, is it true social, uh, that he expects there to be an indictment where he is going to be arrested, uh, this Tuesday. And we, we don't know all the details of what that's going to look like. Um, if it's going to happen or what, you know, if he's going to be handcuffed or not. And as you guys know, Elon, Elon Musk put out a tweet and I, he's absolutely right. He said that uh, if he's handcuffed, uh, it's going to be a landslide election. And um, it, it makes me it makes me think that one or two options. Uh, one is that, as you guys know, my belief is that the world is a stage. It's a movie. It's a script. We're watching, you know, enjoy the performance uh, and. Uh, that they are actually swinging to the right to conservatism that that was made known with the Georgia Guidestones being destroyed and also the Roe versus Wade being overturned. That there is a big swing to the right now to conservatism, and they're paving the way to bring him back as president again. Um, the other part of me thinks, well, my fallback position is that if this is not all scripted and it is actually organic, then um, the liberals have gone full retard this time. And they are just totally blinded in their own disillusions by their worship of the government that they actually think this is a good idea. 
Um, all I have to say is, is that it, this is going to be an interesting week. We don't know what's going to happen, but I, I did not plan this. I did not plan to talk about Trump. And then this hits the news. Comment. I Comment have a, a hypothetical that uh, I'd like you to consider. Um, knowing that the enemy always plays the long game and the deep state and the handlers and controllers have always played the long game. What if, um, uh, here's the hypothetical. What if we ourselves right here and pockets like of us in this group are the last bastion of truth on the earth? <clears throat> we are the last bastion of truth. What better way to uh, destroy the last bastion than to confuse all truth? So let's look at what happens next. In the coming metaverse, in the uh, underverse, the near underverse, you're going to have a way where, in a time where all history is controlled by not just Google, but by everything and anything that they decide to tell us what history is in the future for the next and upcoming generation that does not know us and then has no reference of history or time except maybe for this generation that will speak to it. And then they can go back now and use everything that we've ever said against us by changing everything uh, through the Mandela effects uh, and pointing to us as look how wrong they were, how confused they were, so that will be easier to dismiss us. In all categories, all fields, every conspiracy theory that we've ever talked about or proven that was true, it would be very easy for them in the future then to dismiss us all as quacks and point to uh, all of our truths as being unreal, even the Bible and every historical fact that we are learning now. It will be easy to destroy it all uh, with the coming of the Internet of Things. That's my hypothesis. And I think you're spot on. I think that was spot on. I, I agree. Yeah, they will. Uh, another way to say that is that they're going to take what we say. They're going to weaponize it uh, the same way they did. Well, I won't say his name, but the same way they've done other historical leaders in the past that are now, you know, great villains in history. Um, that, absolutely. But, it, you know, it's interesting to think about how we're almost 10 years into this now. Almost. We're getting there. And so, Dean, you were in it pretty early on. Some of the others, I think Lisa and here were a few of the others. And we have these memories of the way things were. And here we are reporting on this several years down the line to people who have, you know, when you're starting to tell people about the Mandela effect now and, and they're starting to look at it, when, when these things have changed 10 to 15 years ago and you haven't been living that reality... Um, yeah, I mean, just what is it going to be like a generation from now? I mean, you, you've got people now that are actually being, it's, it's kind of like it's crazy to think about how there are adults now, full-grown, full-fledged adults who were born after 9-11. I mean, think about that. For those of you who lived through 9-11, and that was a pivotal moment in your life, like there are two decades have gone by. That, it seems like almost yesterday to me. And, and so you're going to have entire generations. So within 10 years, you're going to have a new generation that has grown up with all these changes and Bible changes, other things, you're going to try to talk to them. They're like, you're crazy, dude. You're, you're crazy. And so I could see just in a generation how they could just confuse everything and make us out to be the crazy people. Absolutely. Of course, we are. We already are the crazy people. Let's admit it. So. <laughs> We are the ones they fear the most. I mean, I've, I've said this before, uh, guys, that, I mean, I, it's like, like the space thing, right? Like how far can they take the space mythology? How far can they take it? Because they keep making these claims that they never fall through. You guys know they haven't returned to the moon. They, they say they have landers on the dark side. We know that's, there is no, you know, dark side um the moon can't even be landed upon but 
you know, they keep talking about these space hotels and space restaurants and space elevators and how they're going to, uh, they don't have the technology to get back to the moon, but they're going to get us to Mars, you know, and they just keep pushing it off, pushing it off. And at some point, you know, you can only, I don't want to underestimate the Intel community because they, they probably have the next hundred years at least planned out. Um, you know, the, 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 the statue revolution that's happening right now, they have that planned out, you know, probably when they planted them, when the, the, when the ladies of the Confederacy were going around planting all those Confederate statues, they probably had it planned out 150 years ago. They, they, they had the long-term plan. So I don't know where this is going, but it's hard for me to envision how they can't erase the Apollo moon landings. Like, they're going to have to, at some point, scrub that so like, even that didn't happen or something along those lines or there's gonna be some twist to it um that is going to just change everything for the next generation and again guys this is where this is why understanding the mandela effect is so important and how easily they can they can tweak something just little words here and there and everywhere and to the point that if you recall the real history you're the lunatic. A good example of this, I should have come. I should have started the introduction on my paper with this, and I might write this in. Is with the uh, the the Soviet Union, and it's a good example because it's it's official history accepts this that when the uh, the Iron Curtain finally came down, uh, the the wall finally came down, and like it was eighty nine, uh, and they started bringing in people into this former Soviet Union to. Uh, talk to people and investigate, and they brought in the the psychologist. They started finding that there was a uh, what they called a false memory syndrome, which is actually what they're calling the Mandela effect now. By the way, there it's like uh, it's called like it's a false memory syndrome. But they were saying the same thing. The psychologist of the Soviet Union that the people in there who were old and who were around for Red October, you know, years before under Stalin, uh, and and so on and so forth, they. Uh, would have been right after the First World War, they had two memories of what went down. They had the real memory of history, and then they had the false memory, which is the official uh, history. And they were conflicted. They had these two th memories, and they didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't know how to compute. There was no one to talk to about it. They just accepted the official history. And that's what the Mandela effect is like. So it's interesting that they're actually using the same sort of uh, Soviet communist uh, rhetoric to describe those who ascribe to the Mandela effect, saying that we have this false memory syndrome. And you could see it happening in real time, that they erase, erase history and give you something new. You know, to expand on the thing you were talking about, how they're going to have to uh, eliminate or whatever, the whole moon landing thing, uh, about three years ago, you could go to the actual uh, official NASA website and there were hundreds of pictures of all of the Apollo moon missions and I actually used those to talk to people and tell them go there and look at the lunar lander and just see how ridiculous that thing is. I said go to their website look at their photos and you can see that you know it's like crepe paper and curtain rods it's a pile of junk. Well, I did the same thing with a new friend of mine just here a few months ago, and they're all gone. All of those pictures have been erased from the NASA website. So I think you're correct. I think they're working towards scrubbing that whole thing out because with the advent of the Internet and all of the digital photography on all this, now we can see just how ridiculous the whole thing was. Yeah, the, 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 um, Lisa wanted to talk. I'll, I'll let her jump in. But they're probably... I mean, they'll probably wait till all the baby boomers are dead, and then anyone who was uh, really alive for those missions, so they're probably going to wait for that uh, before they do it. But it, Lisa, you wanted to say something, I think. Yes, when you were talking about the the moon landing and them trying to erase that, has anyone seen the new commercial? I seen it last night on TV, um, where it's the moon landing, but whenever. The astronauts get there there's some kids up there playing a game and there's an alien craft landing but you know that it's remarking on the original moon landing because as the commercial first starts he's saying that's one small step for man and then he's like houston we have a problem and there's kids there so they're already making it seem like it's a game or that there was something weird about it Yeah, they um, 
they've been doing that for a while now. There was a, there was like a, it was a commercial or some sh- short clip uh, with Ron Howard, and Ron Howard was in the the movie studio walking around, and he was joking. I'd have to find the clip, but he was joking about he was a a boy and he was up in the rafters and he watched them film the the Apollo Eleven moon landing. And he was just joking about it. Like it and they they've been putting that out there so much that it's it's getting ridiculous that people are still denying it. And they're just basically telling you, yeah, it was all it was all filmed. It was all fake. Yeah, I, I think they're having to slowly work it into our, the people's consciousness that it wasn't true just because there's so many people coming to the realization that it can't be true. Like, it's insane. You can't have done that. Right. It, it, it'll be, you know, but it, like I said, though, even, I guess they don't have to scrub it. They could eventually come out with that point and be like, yeah, it, it's kind of like um, if you study Hearst newspapers and if anyone has seen the movie Citizen Kane, for the longest time, it was considered the greatest movie of all time. I don't think it is now. I think it's uh, the Hitchcock movie uh, uh, Vertigo that is number one, whatever. Uh, but the the movie uh, Citizen Kane was based on uh, the Hearst newspapers. And he, I've talked about him a lot in my papers, all his uh, his fake news that he was doing 100, 100 years ago. I mean, he got into the Black Dolly, all that kind of stuff. He was hitting it up. But he literally created the whole, uh, the sinking, I think it was the main and uh, the the Cuban the war with Cuba, he invented the whole thing. It was all made up. There was no attack on a U.S. ship. It was all invented, and his entire war it was called Hearst War. He invented the whole war. It was literally a war in the newspapers. He invented, and um, that's kind of I mean that was kind of even commented upon when I was in high school in the nineties. And that was kind of coming out, and now historians are just like it's just common knowledge. Yeah, that was it was, it was fake. And it, you kind of just accept it, but they're like, oh, well, that happened. You know, that's people used to be uh, that stupid to believe that, but now we're too sophisticated. Now, nowadays, you know, they, that the CIA used to do, you know, MK Ultra stuff. They used to do all that, but they've defunded that. They've taken it away, all that stuff. It's old news. Um, and so what Dean was saying is, is, is accurate. Like they're going to turn this on us. And you know, showing somehow, somehow it's going to be turned on us. We are, we we are the weapons. Like we, they're leaking us this info. We're using it, and they're going to turn it against us. That's the way they operate. And I see it as a race against time. And I don't know how many, besides me, probably feel this, and I bet all of us do, that um, even with the uh, bank bailings, they don't care because they know they're not going to have to be held accountable. The Biden crime family doesn't care because they know they're not going to be held accountable. The DOJ, the FBI, the DNC, they're not going to have to be held accountable because they want in the 2030 agenda, everything to be wrapped up by 2025. So they know Big Pharma will never be held accountable. Nobody is ever going to be prosecuted except maybe Trump uh, just to keep them out of office in 2024 so that by 2025, everything can be accomplished so that by the time 2030 agenda gets here, it's all well underway. That's what they plan. That is why the exponential increase of everything happening and why we've always had wars and rumors of wars. But uh, you must admit, with everything that's going on and how it's coming at us exponentially fast, uh, even with the increase that... uh, you can't even keep up with, uh, you know, the new decorations from week to week, from the balloons to, you know, the train derailments to, and so it's one psyop operation in the media after the other to keep you from uh, learning about what's really going on, so they can keep everybody in fear, everybody confused, everybody programmed, and everybody going along because by the time. Uh, everybody is supposed to be held accountable, nobody will be able to anymore because there'll be so many emergencies going on in the world that the only ones that will be able to control it all will be the controllers and that we're just going to be uh, helpless pawns caught in the middle. By the way, 
That is the uh, John Teeter, the so-called uh, CERN time traveler from the year 2000. That is, <clears throat> that's exactly how he described it, uh, that leading up to the, the Civil War that would divide America um, up and carve them up, that would then lead the Russian Chinese uh, of final conquest and so on and so forth. And he said that leading up to it, Every single month, there would be another Waco-style event that would lead up to uh, America's division and final attack of the government. Um, and when you guys look back just at this year, what, what are we in March? Who here, um, who here remembers the the Chinese New Year shooting? I mean, seriously, like you guys probably forgot about that. They're like, oh yeah, and that was a hoax. And there was like two or three of them all right there together. And these things are happening so fast. It's overwhelming. You can't even dissect these things and show while they're... Like, remember the New York City um, subway shooting? That was so clearly a, a fake drill. And y y like you, you try to bring that up and they're like, old news, moving on, right? As you were saying, Dean, it's like we just got through uh, balloon slash train derailment season. And now we're already on to presidential arrest season this week. And it's just it's happening so fast that there isn't even enough time to comment on this stuff. And remember, like back in the day, right, we had like several years with 9-11. You just dig through and show why it's a hoax. And then, you know, Sandy Hook came along and you had years of that and the Boston bombing. Yeah, They were coming in steadily, but you had time to talk about this stuff and rehearse it with people. And now you just, you just don't have time for that. It's like you, you got 24, 36, 48 hours to show why it's fake moving on to the next thing. And it's becoming incredible how much control like these Intel psyops that they have. And, you know, for anyone out there, if this makes you feel troubled, you know, I want to be clear here that Yah is in control. He is fully in control. He has his angels. Uh, we need to be fully dependent on him and not ourselves. Um, certainly not the government. I think everyone in the room can agree with that. I just want to remind everyone that he is in control. Um, if you guys feel fear and anxiety, you give it to him. Fear is the absence of love. Uh, there's only two prime emotions, fear and love. And, um, and so fear is the absence of love. We don't want that. It does feel like they're like, it's a sprint to the finish. It does. I mean, it. It's like you said. I mean, twenty twenty five, right? That's the year we want. They want to wrap things up for twenty thirty, and that couldn't, have, in my opinion, was most evident in the uh, ceremony, the destruction of the Georgia Guidestones last. Uh, that was July, July sixth. It was, and uh, that seemed to be sending the message. They've done it. It's over. It's done. And now we're just watching the the ripple effects. The the wake of what they did is. It's going to be catching up with us for the next couple of years. Yeah, it, it feels like a race against time. And it feels kind of like the singularity. And I just wonder if we're, we're nearing the end of the week. And then, you know, the eighth day being like eternity and timeless, if it's truly the kingdom that we're approaching, if that's getting closer. But the, um, I wanted to say, um, yeah, like before 2015 and uh, getting into Flat Earth, I was kind of into like shamanism and I was studying that and lucid dreaming and all this stuff. So bringing it to the whole wizards, we do live in a world of wizards. And I was wondering if, Noel, I think we could create our own Mandela effect. If we, we have this group of people that are tuned in and if you chose something or something, we put our intention and prayed for it, it'd be like a counter psyop. So. Whenever, whenever you get around to that, that'd be sweet. All right. Well, <laughs> um, I would very much like the lion to lay with the lamb again. It, it reminds me of that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know why. I just thought of that. No, I won't talk about that. Maybe I just need to pray for that more, that the, the lion lays with the lamb once again. Yeah, I'll, I'll pray for that one, too. Go back to the way it was. Well, guys, I'll give it a couple more minutes. It looks like it's kind of winding down. 
it seems like uh, you guys all really in uh, enjoyed this tonight. I hope you did. And as you guys know, I mean, I'm I'm spent. That takes a lot out of me to to write all that and then read it and um, off and you know for two hours. Does anyone else have any thoughts on anything before the after party begins? Yeah, well, I wanted to comment on something you said earlier um, that you were having some trouble speaking and you were blaming Rivka. Was did I hear that right? It's called the Rivka effect. Yeah. Um, the uh, I, I think it was John Q that that coined that. Uh, you know, she's my little daughter. My my, she's eight month old now, and the love of my life. And a lot changed with her. Um, the quick explanation for those of you who are new: I used to give a talk on Thursday night and Sabbath, two nights a week, two presentations, a lot of material. I used to cover so much, and my, as you can see, for for what I'm coming out with now, it's. It's probably about half as much as I was coming out with then. And uh, the amount I was able to research and write and turn out. And now, because my wife and I both work from home, uh, we kind of, we, we both, you know, we, we, we homeschool the children. They don't go to daycare. They're with us. So we have to raise the children, too. So we have to take turns. I'll work. She watches. And then I watch and she works. We can't work at the same time because we got a little baby. She can't just, you know, you can't just put baby in the corner, right? Um, and so I'll literally have her on my lap and I'm trying to write and edit and it, it, it's called a Rivka effect because I make a lot more writing mistakes, uh, you know, when I'm having a baby on my lap and, uh, I was even joking and it's true that she's kind of a, a moderator in training and like, she likes to mimic me on the keyboard cause she sees me typing on the keyboard. So she puts her hands up and she tries to write too. And I was on this discord uh, site and she just started clapping at the keyboard and somebody's message got erased. I'm like, no, she erased the whole message and I don't know whose it was or what they said. I couldn't get it back. So, um, yeah, there's some, it's what I call Rivka effect. I'm not literally blame. I'm not literally blame shifting a you know, eight month old girl, but I'm not that horrible. I'm just, you know, it's when you have a baby on your lap that the experience changes a lot. Hey, no, uh, you mentioned a, Minimum writing requirement daily. What is that for you? Uh, ten pages. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. If it's if it, if it's a good day, I get ten pages written now, and that's under my current schedule. Now, if you look at some of the great writers in history, they will tell you that um, they would record how just as a warm up before they actually got to the meaty writing like daily they would do a 10 page warm up 10 page warm up just just to get going for their day um and wow. and and not that I'm giving praise to Stephen King but you know he's there, there's a joke out there that nobody has sold uh, aside from Moses nobody has sold more books than Stephen King right and Stephen King will say the same thing. He's like, if you want to be, if you even want to consider yourself a writer, but seriously, if you want to take this seriously, you need to be able to just sit down and write 10 pages daily. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Jack Kerouac wrote on the road in one sitting. He had a roll of butcher paper and he stuck it, the start of it into his typewriter and he just typed until the book was done. And of course, he did have street Adderall, and that's pretty much how he accomplished well, that task. Well, and keep in mind, those guys they really blow my mind because these guys were writing on a typewriter. They didn't even have computers. I mean, you're, you're just typing straight out. Like you don't go back and go, Oh, I want to, you know, add a couple things before that sentence. And it just, you just wrote it out. Uh, you know, when C.S. Lewis wrote the voyage, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, I think the voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, which was the originally the third book in the series. Now it's the, the like the fifth or whatever. Um, he wrote that in one sitting too, I think. It was almost just, uh, the original notes he had, it was almost word for word the exact same. So uh, th that's I find that really incredible with the old typewriter guys. Uh, writers couldn't do that nowadays. It, we, we just don't have the... Um, it's just, it's a totally different game nowadays, obviously. You don't, you don't depend, you know, it's a different, like a different mind process. But the way I, I, I tell this to people, because people come up to me a lot and they'll be like, Oh, I want to be a writer. How do you do it? You know, I want to write a book. And the first thing I'll ask them, I'm like, okay, you want to write a book? They say, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, do you read? Do you read books? And they're like, well, no, why do I need? To? It's like, okay, if you don't read books, you're, you're going to have a hard time writing one because you don't, 
you know, and but it, it's basically like um, uh, like running a, a triathlon. All right. So you look at these dudes who are in these competitions who they're just ripped and they can do all these amazing things. You don't just say, I want to run a triathlon. You don't even say, I want to run a marathon. Maybe if, if you are inexperienced, you can crawl across the marathon line half dead after several hours, right? But it takes a lot of running and running and running and running and running to do it, right? And eventually you get to the point where you just go out and do it. And that's what it's like. So, but yeah, for me, it's a minimal of 10 pages if it's a good day that I can sit down under my current strain of getting stuff out. Thank you.